So, we've been trying to get Jeff Thompson on for ages, and <laughs> this is a story of childhood abuse and the manifestation of that, how to deal with it, how not to deal with it. Our mission statement on this channel is end the war on drugs, start the war on the predators, and this ties right in because what we've seen is this trajectory of so many people who've been to prison have stories of childhood abuse. And as they get older, it leads to getting involved in drugs, drug trafficking, violence, and criminality. And then they end up in the prison system. But when their lives are analyzed, you see the harm these predators cause and this trajectory just being repeated over and over. And for the women, we see the women exactly the same. They get into drugs and instead of violence and drug trafficking, to feed their habits, they often get into sex work. So, Jeff is a prolific author, and we will be putting links in the description box to his books. He's kindly brought along one, two, three, four, five, six books a day. And I've heard about the uh, accomplishments that Jeff has reached with these books over the years prior to Jeff coming here today. I knew that there was a motion picture from one of his books. And I also knew that there was a, a play made out of one of his books as well. Now, another thing about Jeff, and we've never had, ever had, an eighth Dan in here. So, us, <laughs> us. Um, I did karate. Um, I did my training for my black belt. Work took over, and I never got to do the actual exam. But bloody hell, eighth Dan. I didn't even know Dan's went that high. Well, this is the mecca of Crassy Liverpool, isn't it? Terry O'Neill, you know, uh, Bob Point, and I think Bob Point has died now, and um, Andy Sherry, Frank Brennan. This is, this is the mecca of where Shotokan Karate started. I mean, Terry O'Neill was my hero. Terry O'Neill was actually the first person to publish me. He had a magazine, a really good, high-level, glossy magazine called uh, Terry, Terry O'Neill's Fighting Arts International. And he published me in that. He was the first person to publish me. And bearing in mind, he was my hero. I mean, he was a god. You know, he looked like he was made out. He's still around. He was a very, very famous Liverpool doorman. But I came to meet him once. It was like being invited to, invited to have tea with the Queen. <laughs> and he was so gracious. Um, but, you know, looked like he'd been carved out of granite. Just a very, a very, very amazing man. But he, he was a hero of mine. He was a hero to a lot of people. And I sent my first article to him. And it would be a bit like sending, it, sending your first piece to the Times as a martial artist because it was a very glossy magazine and it was full of the demigods of martial arts, you know. And he actually rang me up and said, um, I've given this to my editor. And he says, you have something. You have a voice. Um, and in it, anybody that understands writing or music or art, everybody wants to you're looking for your voice. Um, and he published me. And when I was writing my new book, uh, Notes from a Factory Floor, it was the first time I recognised that that was the genesis of my published work, that one article. Um, and as Al Ghazali would say, the great Muslim I imam, I, once I published uh, this article, I was noticed. He says, when you fall to the left or you fall to the right, you are noticed. So suddenly you write an article and you're noticed. And you think, oh, that's why people don't write. That's why people don't do podcasts. That's why people don't publish, because you are noticed. And people want you to qualify what you're saying. But that's good, because, it, because in order to qualify, you have to go into the minutiae. You have to go into the exegesis. So Terry O'Neill was um, very kind to me. Um, and I can still see him now. I can still see him in my mind. And the, the articles he used to put in his magazine were just legendary about real you know real kind of um real congruent martial artists you know these were these were people that could have it outside the chip shop on a friday night you know it wasn't it wasn't the pseudo martial arts it was um it was tried and tested you know so that was my first article and that led on to um watch my back um and then watch my back tiny little book that big when i first did the, did the first version um, Coventry bouncer, floor sweeper, writes a book. Um, I end up going on. I was, I was on talk shows when that book came out with Hollywood legends, and 
and uh, still working as a bouncer and still working in the factory. So it just kind of piqued the interest of people. And a lot of people, especially locally in Coventry, were saying, well, who wants to write, read about a Coventry bouncer? You know, a knuckle dragger. But actually, it wasn't about a Coventry bouncer. It was about a depressed man um, who'd uh, become a bouncer in order to overcome his fears. So it was about fear. It was about depression. Ultimately, it was about sexual abuse and the uh, displacement of sexual abuse. You know, how, I, how at the age of 11, I was this soft creative beautiful little boy looked like a girl got sexually abused groomed and abused and at the age of 30 I was battering people and kicking their teeth out because I felt I had to protect myself against the world I had to protect the world but I became a monster myself you know so it's uh, it, it wasn't you know at the time a few people scoffed about the book I didn't care I was published you know but it was, um, it was probably my, working as a bouncer was probably my first metaphysical experience. I wasn't guarding the door of a shitty nightclub, Sean. I was guarding the door to my heart. I was guarding the door to my will, you know. That's what I was doing. It was very metaphysical, very powerful. So, yeah, um, my, <laughs> I've only just realised it now I'm talking to you, my kind of literary career, which went into theatre, film, a uh, bit of journalism, books, uh, poetry started in Liverpool, strangely enough. And we're gonna, that was a good um, description of where we're going to be going then. Before th we start, though, how many years of martial arts did you do to become an eighth, Dan? Uh, so I started at 11. Um, I'm 60 now, so 50 years. I'm still training, but I'm doing more internal work now. So at, you get to a certain point. I think I mentioned to you before the interview, it's good to get the grades. It's good to have an eighth dam because you, once you get it, you can dismiss it. The best one I got was my fifth dam because it was a master grade. Like, and you, I was really proud of myself. And then I looked in the mirror and I saw this fat, overweight, um, violent, insecure, um, sensitive, articulate, but, but um, ultimately violent, young guy who was not a master of anything. I could have a fight outside the chip shop. That was about it. And it was shocking to have this master grade and look in the mirror and think, I'm still addicted to pornography. I'm a bully. I'm violent. I'm hugely insecure. I'm psychotically jealous. You know, these are the things that this, this grade showed me. All of those things, if you bumped into me in the street, you might not have noticed that because I, I had a good facade. But that's what it was. And the, the fifth Dan, as my friend Peter Constein said, it's often not, you don't often get it for what you've done. You get it for what you need to do next. So I got that grade and I thought, I've got, I've got to honour this. I need to be congruent. My thinking and my saying and my doing need to be in alignment. I've got no centre otherwise. Otherwise, I'm just, you know, I'm just thrown about by the wind. You know, if, I, if I'm so insecure that somebody can take my power with as little as a slight in a road rage incident. If they can get me out of my car and fight in, in a, with a slight, I've got no power. Who am I? This is what I ultimately said. Who am I without this big right hand? I wasn't anybody. What I did learn from that whole experience, you know, from getting to the fifth dan um, and the discipline and, uh, you know, standing on doors and facing fears, intercoursing with fears, what I learned from that was massive, but I had to take it from the lesser the lesser war, which is the external stuff, and I had to take it inwards. So I had to look at all these projections, all these monsters around me that I was projecting, you know, through my damaged filters, and I had to trace those monsters back and find the source of them in me. And when I found the source of them in me, then I had, that was the real war, because then it becomes about repentance or about, uh, the Buddhists would call repentance repair or return. So returning to homeostasis, returning to um, our natural kindness. So that, um, Terry O'Neill said it to me once. He said, um, was, he's talking about Don Draga. And he said, Don Draga said, uh, who was a very, very legendary martial arts guy, he said, um, if you're in a room full of people, they should be better protected because you're there. Not just because they're protected, you can protect them against other people, but they're protected against you. You're not going to savage somebody because they look at you wrong. 
You're not going to savage somebody because they slight you or because they chip away at your ego. So the, the whole idea then was that you go inwards and you start working inwards and then it become, uh, Muhammad would call it the, the greater jihad, the bigger battle. So he would say that the lesser battle is when you try and fix the world, when you try and roll your sleeves up and you go out and you, you take on the monsters out there. The greater battle is when you recognise the corrupt politician, um, you know, the, uh, the greedy banker, um, the dishonest politician, you know, the violent fundamentalist, when you recognize them in yourself, when you recognize them in the self, then you're cooking on gas, then you can start to work. And that, Sean, is worth getting up in the morning for. How old were you at the fifth, Dan? I would have been probably late 30s, 40. I've been training, I've been training since I was 11, so um, I probably would have been... Yeah, probably my late 30s. Because around about that same time, I took my downgrade in judo as well, which I felt, I felt, I felt in, in every, I went, I did full-time judo for 18 months with Neil Adams. I wanted to improve my ground game. And, uh, you know. Eighth um, Dan and double Dan's in judo. I, I, I trained in everything. I trained in Greco-Roman wrestling, freestyle wrestling, collegiate wrestling. I trained in Thai boxing. I trained in Western boxing. You know, I trained in, uh, in judo, specifically judo. I went into, I gave up my job and I trained in everything because I, wa I wanted security. But I recognized that when I got all those grades and all those dans, and at one point I had them all listed on a, on a, <laughs> on a business card, just in case you didn't know I was dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I am dangerous. Look, I've got, I've got the war paint, and I've got the, all the my qualifications on here. But of course, it was just a projection of my insecurity. But good to have them because the discipline of it. You know, the the great thing was that when I went, when I became a doorman, I bumped into the greatest teacher of all. Because when you go into a world like bouncing, well, you go into any environment. There is an egregore there waiting for you. The, you know that's you know that world is a is a corporation, and around that corporation is built a an egregore like a um, uh, like a being. So the collective knowledge of that environment is in a being that you bump into when you become a doorman, and it gives you it's it's greater than the sum of all its parts. So when you go into that environment, it goes oh this is Jeff Thompson. Um, he's, uh, I think I was a second Dan when I became a bouncer. He's a second Dan. He's, uh, he wants to find out what works. He wants to understand what works. Um, and this is the pace he can work at. And this is, this is, you know, the level we can take him to. So this environment starts to inform you. And it says, we'll show you what works. We'll show you what works in this environment. It's not moral or ethical. It's neither right or wrong. It's just what works in this environment. Um, and you can take it and use it or you can dismiss it, but if you dismiss it, you might die. So, you know, which is a very real threat. Four of my friends were murdered during the time when I was a bouncer. In Coventry, you could start a fight in an empty room. It was that kind of environment. There's a massive amount of violence in Coventry. Even the hot dog vans had bouncers. So I went into the environment. Uh, people used to tip hot, down, hot dog vans up everywhere. There was bouncers everywhere. You, we used to get paid four times the hourly rate of a factory worker. And you have to be prepared to take on the best in the city. At least, at least be level with them or take them on. And I wasn't that good. Uh, you know, I, I learned as I went. But the biggest thing I learned, Sean, was that the environment taught me. The environment showed me what worked. But it was difficult because it said, before you learn what works, you need to dismiss all the other stuff. Well, the other stuff you've learned, you need to let it go. It's complicating it. What you need here is simple. You need to be first. You need to have one very powerful technique. Uh, for me, it was a right cross. For John Anderson, it was a left hook. For Tony Roberts, it was a, a headbutt. You know, each person had their own little thing. And they would go through literally hundreds. Some of the guys would go through thousands of fights on one technique. There's the moment I went on the door and seen that, and saw what was real and, and saw the truth of it and recognized that the environment was teaching me. I went back to my class. I had a little class and I just said to the class, we're doing this all wrong. We're doing this all wrong. This isn't honest. This isn't going to help people. And we changed everything. And that tiny, I was like a, an unheard of second dam, a club player. And that tiny bit of 
certainty that I found um, in Islam, they would call it yakim, which is, like, which is like an attribute of the absolute. That tiny little bit of certainty rippled out until over the, over the period of about 10, 15 years, I ended up teaching everywhere and ended up teaching in Las Vegas for Chuck Norris. I went to, I was invited over by Chuck Norris three times to teach for his people. But that, wow. but, that, but that truth came from a tiny little shitty nightclub in Coventry. But the environment, don't forget, it's not just the environment in Coventry. It was the, it was the whole door environment everywhere. The, the egregore is everywhere. It takes all that collective knowledge. And, and if you are willing to let go of what you know um, and dismiss it, and that, took, that was quite difficult because letting go of what I know meant letting go of you know, um, the gods of martial arts, letting go of my teachers, um, not arguing with my teachers, but um, going against what they were teaching me because they were all saying block and counter, trap and counter, wait for them to attack. And when I went onto this, into this environment, he said, that won't work here. You'll get savaged here. You need to be preemptive. You need to be first. And it was so simple, but it was so revolutionary. I also recognised that most of the systems were very like one range systems, you know, kicking, punching or grappling. And you needed all of the ranges. You specifically needed close range punching. You needed artifice. You needed to develop the, the uh, Kotodama Gaku, which is the use of sound, the use of the voice. And we're using the voice here in a very different way, but it's the same thing. So you started to learn to use the, the voice as a weapon. You started to use uh, very short range techniques as weapons can you give an example of the voice as a weapon uh an example of the voice of, uh, as a weapon it could, it could be posturing where you just you know you just come out and you just you you know you're not shouting old ladies onto a bus but you make yourself large and you posture and you use your voice with intent to say this is what's going to happen if you cross that threshold this is what's going to happen john anson would lean in and just whisper and he would just go if you don't walk away from here factory worker you know, you're a factory worker. We do this full time. This is our job. If you don't walk away from here, you're going to be carried out in an ambulance. So we just whisper to people, do you want me to embarrass you in front of your friends? Sometimes you would posture and the posturing would be like, you know, um, short staccato words, which would trigger someone's adre adrenaline, trigger the flight instinct. And it was done specifically to trigger their flight instincts so that they would run away because people didn't realize how dangerous it was in those environments if they weren't used to it. You know, the bouncers who were good, it was like they, it's like they, like they knew magic. They just knew a little bit more than uh, the average man so they could take most people out of a situation before they even knew they was in a situation. So they were, they were very powerful at what they did. Some of the stuff John would use um, would be so close range that somebody would just fall on the floor and nobody would know who hit him. It was so quick, and it was also so powerful, but it was also very dangerous. But bearing in mind, you know, the heightened level of fear because people were being killed and the, the guys had to be on the ball. So you learned to use these techniques. The environment taught you that. When but, you say people were being killed, what do you mean by that? You who, know, were the, who were the people who were killing them? Well, just people getting killed in fights. Okay, in, in the bars and clubs. In the bars, in the clubs, yeah. Were, and, 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 this, and the surrounding environment. Yeah. So, you know, one of my friends was stabbed in the heart outside a nightclub. Um, you know, there were two guys stabbed in the leg and died in one incident. You know, a couple of my other friends were, were killed in peripheral incidents of violence who were bouncers. So were you present the, during a, any of those? Another guy, another friend of mine uh, who I worked with got hit on the back of the head. No, I wasn't yeah. there. I was, you know, I obviously went to the funerals of oh. these people and went to see them in the wake and it was very sobering. So you never lost sight of the fact that it was dangerous. So you had to learn to control your endocrine system. You had to learn to control the, symp the sympathetic nervous system. You learn by learning to control your sympathetic nervous system, you learn to control other people's sympathetic nervous system. That was a blessing because you could use that to dissuade them from fighting. So by posturing, by, um, by using certain key words, you know, by, by making people time travel. So you take people out of their body and you go, I'm going to take you to tomorrow and I'm going to show you where you are tomorrow in your factory. And this team here are going to come to your, house, your factory tomorrow and we're going we're gonna to come and see you because of what you do tonight. So do you want that? 
and they would they would automatically break out of where they were um, and you bring them back to their body and they would back away so we'd use certain things like that to protect people from themselves does alcohol complicate the calculations in situations like that it, it calculates people's um uh it, what, what it does within a nightclub environment or within a pub environment, you know, as a bouncer, I never drank, so it didn't complicate it for me, but it complicated it for other people because they would be unpredictable. They would go out of a binary type of uh, thinking and they'd go into this quantum place. You didn't know whether they were going to be a wave or a particle. You didn't know whether they were going to nut you or stab you. you. You had no idea because they didn't have any idea. They would just be displacing a bad day, a bad week, a bad year or bad life into any authority figure that tried to stop them. And it was difficult not to see them as monsters. You learned to widen your consciousness and your awareness so that you could start to see what they were. But in the beginning, they were all monsters. And you would batter them to save yourself. And you'd think, I've just battered a monster. And then the next day, you might be walking through the city centre and you'd see that same guy um, and he's, he's got his kids holding the pram he's got a baby in the pram he's got his wife who's surveying what's left of his face and you look at it and you just feel this deep deep remorse this deep shame and you go fucking hell i've just battered a, a daddy i've just battered a factory worker i've just started a, a battered a husband and that's not what he looked like last night so that's why later on you start you started to uh, go into the heka into the kotodama gaku go into the use of sound so it became much more, um, much less Joe Louis and much more Kissinger. So you'd start to use badinage, you'd start to use dialogue. You'd posture if you needed to, if it wasn't, you know, that, that, the, that, that sound was so offensive, it would literally push people back, trigger their flight response, and they would disappear. So we would use all that stuff, you know, and obviously eventually, once you get, to the, once you get beyond the physical, once you get to the fact that you go, okay, this is what works physically, I'm knocking people out every night. You start to bump into the humanity and you're thinking, I'm not, I'm not um, saving the world here. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I thought I was protecting myself. I thought I was protecting the people in the club and the license of the club, the good, you know, the good majority from the bad minority and the indifferent from themselves. But actually, you start to recognize on a metaphysical level, these are monsters of my own projection. These are all my damaged... Um, pain bodies or my damaged cognitions coming through a filter and they're projected in front of me I'm, I'm creating monsters with my thinking literally I'm forgetting I've created them then I'm designing tools and weapons and armory to defend myself against the very weapon the very monsters that I've created once you get that that's another thing the environment teaches you going once you start to see that it's you that you're a shit magnet you know, you're, you're attracting violence like metal filings to a magnet. You start to go, OK, so this, what happened to me was, you know, I, I said to my wife one day, this city is so violent. Everywhere I go, there's violence. And she said, Jeff, there's a common denominator. It's everywhere you go. <laughs> and it was she really hit me and she was right because I was getting in road rage incidents. I was getting in fights at weddings, fights at funerals. I was working on the door. Um, you know, where, wherever I went, I was getting in fights. So I was, I was not just attracting it, but creating it. Um, and I recognised that my thinking, my my belief that the world needed be needed to be protected by me, was so strong. I built the infrastructure, I built the nightclubs, you know, the pubs, these violent environments. Um, everywhere I went, somebody needed to be defended by me. The whole infrastructure was built up by me. I thought this is really powerful, but I couldn't not con I couldn't control it. So I thought I've got to start working on this because if I'm if I'm creating a shitstorm with my thinking, then maybe I can reverse that. Maybe I can reverse it so that I can take that same raw energy, that same powerful energy, and create something beautiful with it. So just pass me that there, Sean, if you wouldn't mind. So if you look at that, that's watch my back. That's just, I've done 50 books now, but that's an example. 50? I know. But 50? That, that's, <laughs> I thought I was prolific. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an example of, 
uh, that's an example of um, um, taking that powerful energy that I've got that was spilling, that was displacing, that was hurting people and bringing it into alignment, into a congruence and creating something beautiful with it. So this is, this is, a, this is a book full of truth. It's a book full of certainty. It's very violent in places and the violence never qualifies itself other than that it disqualifies itself. I say that violence, even when it's well intended, always rebounds on itself. If you're violent, it's because you've fallen out of alignment. So we want to get our alignment so strong that all we're creating is beauty and love when we're creating that from the place of kindness. So I've got these 50 books and films. The last film I did with Orlando Bloom is just up for the BAFTAs at the moment. And it's a film about the metaphysical power of forgiveness. Um, and the creation of that was me channeling all that energy and through different filters. So instead of going, yeah, the world's in a shit state and it needs me to stand on a nightclub door and bang people to fix it, I was actually making things worse, you know. Uh, but the lovely Nietzsche thing, you know, be careful when you hunt the dragon that you don't become the dragon. Be careful when you look into the void because it's looking back at you. So you start to bump into that. We talked about it before, didn't we, Sean, when we were saying what Aeschylus said, the, the Greek, um, the Greek uh, philosopher, those who learn suffer. I've, I, I looked at all that, but to change it and to take away the armor, to take away, uh, it's what Budo means, the, the higher level of training, no arms. It means to take away the physical and the violence, to take away that and leave yourself vulnerable and surrender yourself to a greater will, to a higher will, is the hardest thing I've ever done. It's much easier to stand on a nightclub door and have somebody saying, I'm going to come round, and I'm going to come round your house at four in the morning and shoot your wife and shoot your kids. That was easier than going inside and cleaning up the mess that was in there. It was easier, much easier to do that than it was to find the people who had possessed me, um, the false perceptions, the false beliefs, the false cognitions you know all that damaged all, all that um damaged schema were inside me it was much more easy to to work outside than it was to go in and fix it at this at the core so this is an example the films and all the rest of it is an example of channeling all that same energy into something beautiful and that if there's anybody out there now especially if they're depressed if they're fearful um if they've got anxiety it's just energy waiting to be produced. It's, it's, in a, it's in a state of superposition. I don't know nothing about quantum mechanics, but I understand that superposition is when something is in a, an energy is in a state where it can become anything. Once we, once we, you know, once we direct it, it becomes something. So we have a choice. So we can go from that superposition and create something amazing with it which is and that might be that might just be simply um ha, you know being kind to somebody giving some kid on the street enough money for a cup of tea um it might it, you know it might be writing a book or doing a podcast um but ultimately you know it's got to come from a place of kindness so when i look at this now the reason i love this and i love the feel of it is because it's done it's written i've taken that dark energy and i've made it into something spiritual it's also, um, di it's didactic, but it's also um, intercessionary. You know, this is a very entry-level book. It's a base book about a man that's afraid and he becomes a bouncer to overcome his fear. It's my, it's my story. But if that lands in the, in the hands of somebody that is depressed, who's waking up at four in the morning in a cold sweat and can't go on, and it just piques a little bit of curiosity... If he's just curious about, oh, this guy was like me. He was depressed and he's taken that energy and he's, instead of thinking it's a harbinger of doom, he's looked at it as a messenger of hope. Instead of thinking it's a monster, it's just, a, it's just an, an energy. It's a, an unco it's, it's a conceptualized energy that can be broken down to its component parts and created into anything if I can control that. Um, so this is the... This is, this was my story about me capturing my will. My will was stolen from me at the age of 11 by a, by a teacher that had groomed me and abused me. So in the Old Testament, the word will comes from the root word. Uh, the word land comes from the root word will. So when they talk about enter the land, the land of milk and honey, seek the kingdom, 
It's talking about capture your own will, win your own will back against conditioning, against negativity, win it back against all of these false perceptions and cognitions, all this, you know, thousands of years of conditioning. Win your will back. When you win your will back, you, you are connected to the quantum, you're connected to everything. So this was about me taking my will back and saying, I'm not going to displace my energy out there anymore and batter people. I'm going to channel my energy with my will and I'm going to put it into a book, into a play, into a film. And it's possible, because I mean, I didn't publish my first book until I was uh, 32. So it's possible for anybody to be creative if, if they want to be creative. There's a wonderful quirk with the brain, which um, doesn't allow it to sit in curiosity and fear at the same time. So if you're waking up with depression or if you've got a drug problem or you've got issues with your life, if you start to look at that curiously and go, OK, this, I'm in this situation and it feels like it's never going to go away and it feels like there's not an answer. But I know there are people out there who have found an answer. You know, you mentioned before about you had problems before. Did you, have you talk, did you talk about that? No, that's a, so well, sorry. I won't okay, sorry. No. So you, you know, you've taken whatever you've got and you're channeling it into something beautiful. You're trying to put something out there to help people get away from drugs and all the rest of it. I'm taking my stuff and I'm making something beautiful from it as well. So they can as well. You know, I mean, you've got a massive following, a huge following now because you've decided to take a binary energy and put it into, put it into a place where it can expand and do something positive, you know. So that's what I do. That's, that's what I'm doing all the time. But it's about winning back your will. And my will, uh, the word will or the word heart or the word soul are, are kind of synonymous. So when somebody steals your autonomy, your will, they're taking a part of your soul. They're taking, a, they're taking um, your freedom. When you win that will back by going to war with all the parasites that are in us, you know, these false beliefs and this conditioning, um, when we go to war with it and win our will back, then we connect to everything. And then yeah. anything is possible. Anything is possible. Beautifully said. Um, I'm sure some of my more rabid followers are, are rooting for me to get some crazy stories out of you at this point. So I'll start with what are the most dangerous situations you've ever been in in your life? Well, we, we worked in a place called, <coughs> called Buster's. I worked, well, I worked everywhere in Coventry, <clears throat> worked at lots of different places. So, you know, every single night, you know, people were being stabbed, you know, you know, people were pulling guns out and, um, you know, there was, there wasn't a single night I worked ever. There wasn't a single night in all those years where something didn't kick off. The most difficult, I think the most difficult situations were, were less about the violence and more about the, the comebacks. You know, the anticipation was always difficult. The fighting itself took, took care of itself, but the, post, uh, the post-traumatic stuff was, the, was probably the worst, especially during the time I was working, I, I was up for um, three section 18s, which sometimes that goes to police station level, sometimes it goes to CPS level, Crown Prosecution Service, and that can linger in your life for months and months. So you're carrying that in your, uh, in your central nervous system. That's in your cornflakes in the morning. That's in the sex when you're having sex with your wife. That's in your chips at night. You know, so you're carrying that with you everywhere. I think the most difficult situations, one, one, of the, one really bad situation we had was, was when we got involved with a, a group of soldiers um, who were very well trained, but they didn't understand our environment. And when you say involved, what do you mean? Um, the, the, a fight kicked off in the nightclub with a with a group of soldiers who were on leave, um, and it ended up in a real bloodbath. I had a knuckle duster, um, and I was uh, I took it, I put it on because it was we were so overwhelmed, and I hit everything that moved, everything. The so most, how, many so, how many soldiers were there? And what were the warning signs? Uh, well, it was we were trying to. There were there was a, probably about half a dozen soldiers. They were kicking off in the club, playing up, and we were just trying to ask them to leave. Our policy was always we talk to people, we try and get them out, um, and they just kicked off. As soon as they kicked off, we actually physically grabbed them and tried to pull them out. Then they started to attack us. Being green and being, um, uh, I suppose, inexperienced, I put a knuckle duster on. The knuckle duster I had was um, given to me by a guy called John Anderson. He made it for me, and it was like 
you didn't get one of these until you were part of the team. So I was insecure and naive. So as soon as it kicked off with all of these soldiers, I put it on and hit everybody. But it was devastating because it's bad enough hitting people anyway. But when you're hitting people with, with a knuckle duster on, everything explodes. So it was a massive amount of damage. But of course, it was all on CCTV. So that, that, that we coped with that situation, but that wasn't the most dangerous. That wasn't the, the frightening part. The frightening part was when the police came, got us herded into the manager's office and made us watch the video. And I was on there using this knuckle duster. Um, and, uh, you know, I can remember watching my whole life disappear, thinking because you're using a knuckle duster, you, you know, you're, you're breaking skin or breaking bones. So you're looking at, you know, a, a minimum five years. I've got a wife, I've got a family. So it's quite terrifying to sit there thinking that, that this is going to happen. He's watching the video. This is him watching my back. Um, they're watching this CCTV and they said, the, the sergeant in the room suddenly says, stop the video. And he stops it and he says, who's that? And I said, that's me. He says, you're using a knuckle duster. I said, I'm not. But everything inside me, I've got a centre. I've got like a, like a, an eye wall, and I'm in the eye wall, but I can feel it crack him, and he, and the whole room falls into a, an abstract. It's like we're there for 20 years in about five seconds. He said, "You're using a knuckle duster, and that's out of order." I said, "I'm not using a knuckle duster." Anyway, they took us all to the police station. How um, obvious was it on the camera? They they said, "You could see you could see me doing this." Yeah, and and then. You could see this. You couldn't see anything. But when they went back to the police station, I found out later, because I used to teach a few policemen, they said they took the picture, they blew it up, they Slow put it on the down, wall, they did yeah. everything they could. But what happened to, to save us was, um, was that when they were, we, we all got arrested, uh, the soldiers got arrested as well because they were violent. But as soon as the soldiers got arrested, they attacked the police. So because they attacked the police, the police were in no hurry to do them a favour. There was one policeman that I was in the police station all night long and there was one policeman just kept saying, you're not going to be leaving here. You are not going to leave here. To you are the soldiers. Yeah, to me. To me, you're not leaving here because you used a duster. But I was, my nature was I was just, I was nice to the police. I was polite with them. I was respectful with them. I had a lot of respect for the law. So I just said, I just kept saying, you know, I've done nothing. You know, I'm just defending myself. But because they attacked the police, in the end, even the police were on my side, other than this one guy. The, other, the police were arguing amongst themselves about whether or not I should be charged and whether or not they should let me go. But because I was polite and I'd made a few friends and because the prisoners, um, this was around about the time of the Fortlands, because I remember one of the policemen, one of the guys saying, I've just come back from the Fortlands. And the guy said, well, you may have took the Fortlands, but you didn't do very well at Buster's <laughs> nightclub. So it was... <laughs> the, so, <laughs> so it was... Um, so the situations themselves were never as frightening as the comebacks. And the comebacks would be, you know, you might get a phone call. Um, we're going to shoot your wife. We're going to shoot your children. You know, um, uh, or you might, you know, uh, people turn up at your factory where you work. Or, but because Coventry, again, we talk about this egregore, we, we talk about in Coventry at the time because it was so violent. There was a whole group of doormen, of bouncers, um, maybe about 50 that would go out every month, once a month for drinks with each other. All the different doormen from different clubs would go around and they would go to all of these different bars and drink and, and maybe have something to eat to let everybody in the city know that if you attack one doorman, you attack all doormen. So there was security and the police respected us because most of the pe people we dealt with were stepping outside of the law and the police couldn't step outside of the law to stop them but we could so we often stepped outside of the law in order to to neutralize the situation but we also knew how to use the law we you, we knew how to speak the law so we recognized that people are convicted for what they say not for what they do so we made sure that we understood can't the you know the law of self defense from the book of common law we knew what to say we knew the right words to say so that we didn't you know, we didn't get ourselves in trouble because of what we said. And if what we did add steps outside the law, we would bring our retelling of it back inside the law. And again, because the, we were dealing with people, a lot of the very violent people we dealt with were very violent against the police as well. So quite a few people, quite a few times I was in for Section 18s, um, it was against people that were also violent against the police. Um, so when they went in, I mean, I remember going in one time and, you know, uh, 
it's in, again, it's in Watch Me Back, but, you know, the policeman was writing my statement for me, so I didn't perjure myself because this, this guy I'd had a fight with, had, um, he'd battered policemen, you know, so they're not in any hurry. They're How not did in that hurry. fight start? That, that just started with people, fight, with, with people among, fighting amongst themselves within the club. We'd go in. We'd have alarms all over the club. We'd go in. Our job was to either talk it down. If it was already fight, if they're already fighting, we'd drag them out. And that would be it. We'd be, be physical and get them out. But um, if they started to attack the doorman, then, then we would defend ourselves. Um, and then it was just understanding how, it was understanding how to negotiate that. So sometimes you could tell by standing in front of somebody, you could tell their intent just by standing there and looking at them. You knew by their body language, you knew by the twitches, you knew by the fact that they become monosyllabic, you knew the fact about their body positioning when they were about to attack because you understood it. So this is what we talked about before, about this level of magic where you, are, where you understand more about them than they do because, you're, because the, the environment has taught you to read the signs. So you understood when they were about to attack, and if you knew they were going to attack, you would attack preemptively. From the outside looking in, it looked bad because you attacked first. Um, but f from your perspective, you understood that if you didn't, you were going to be a victim. And then if you got arrested, you would use the you would use the book of common law as your defence and just say it was I had honest belief he was going to attack me, so I attacked first. That was kind of the the uh, the darker end of it, and that was every night. So stabbings, and you know, and um, especially in other areas, other corners of the city, we started to get a lot of problems with drugs. So there was a lot of uh, shootings and that as well. But understanding that, understanding how it worked, and and recognizing that I'd gone from being depressed, being afraid of a spider in the bath, to standing on nightclub doors controlling myself in very difficult situations going from from that one end to the other and they might they might seem very uh, disparate you know a, a fear of spiders and a fear of you know and, a, and somebody trying to stab you but actually they're only separated by degree so if you can control the endocrine system the, you know your nervous system stay in the center build a center build a um, like an eye wall there you can learn to control these situations and then it's only one step away from that to start going okay um I, maybe i can take that courage and that knowledge and and give up my job and become self-employed or maybe i can you know i can do use that courage to leave the factories i don't have to be a sheet metal worker you know i can be something else so i took that courage and I took that learning and I took it into other areas. But more than anything else, I, I didn't stay at the level of violence. Very quickly, we were in violent situations and very quickly I started to think, this isn't how I want to live. I don't want to live like this. I was aware that people were afraid of me. My wife was afraid of me. My, my kids were afraid of me. And it's not a very nice thing to say and I don't like to say it, but I didn't want people to be afraid of me. And they weren't afraid of me because I was a good guy. They were afraid of me because I was insecure and I was a hair trigger so i wanted to go below this most people stayed at the level of violence this is how a fight works this is how you knock somebody out i wanted to go beyond that i wanted to go to the cause of it so if i'd have gone on the door and ended up in in lots of violent situations which if people want to read about them they're all in here i don't really want to retell them because it's a difficult it's a difficult place to go because it was such an ugly part of my um arc but in, but important because if if i hadn't had that you know I'm a Guli Mar I'm, I'm a man Guli Marla, you know, uh, the Buddhist saint, you know, no one would have listened to him or no one would have listened to um, Milarepa if he hadn't been violent first or St. Paul. His writings are important because he was a violent anti-Christian. So the idea is that, you know, you talk about where you were and what you've done and how violent that was, but only so that you can um, use it as a, as a launch pad to kind of say there's a better way to live. It's not a good way to live because, like I said, what are you without that right hand? There's always someone with a bigger right hand or someone with a knife or someone with a, with a gun or somebody with a team. You know, you've got, we've got to find out who you are beyond those physical things. And that's what I started to look at. I started to go inside. I started to teach all the stuff um, that I was learning. But, of course, because I was teaching it, and I was teaching it not just to other martial artists, but to all sorts of groups of people, lots of intellectuals who would demand that I qualify 
what I was teaching. So it made you go into the exegesis of it, the, the, you know, the explanation. So you'd have to start really trying to qualify, why am I being violent? I start off in Watch My Back saying that violence can only be stopped by greater violence. And of course, it's a really naive thing to say. But by the end of the book, I'm just kind of saying, listen, if you're centered, if you find your, your geometric point, your singularity, if you find that magic bowl in the very center, there'll be no enemy. There'll be no, one to, there'll be no enemy to fight against. There'll be no need for weapons. There'll be no illness. And if there's no illness, there's no need for remedy. There'll be no issue because you've found the center. So the, the violence was very good for me because the violence ex expanded in my life very quickly and I was getting in hundreds of fights. Um, and when I realized it was me, it was everywhere I went, I was taking it with me. I was the atmosphere. There was a bad atmosphere and I was it. When I realized it was me, it was a very frightening time. And it was a very exciting time. It was frightening because I just thought that means I've got to change all this stuff. It means I've got to give up the arms. It means I've got to find a better way. But it was also exciting because I was thinking, well, if I can go from being afraid of spiders in the bath, if I can go from being a, a young married guy with kids who is debilitated by depression, if I can go from someone that's been groomed and, and severely damaged uh, in his psyche um, and, and go to live a, a prolific and a balanced and a creative life, then that must be possible for everybody. I remember as a depressed guy um, reading everything, Sean, and thinking I'm going to find out how this works. You know, I'm going to find out what's wrong with me. I'm going to find out why, why this feeling is in me and I'm possessed by it. And I'm trying to run it out and I'm trying to scrub it out of me in the shower and I'm trying to beg it out of me and, and I'm, I'm waking at four in the morning in a cold sweat and I'm just thinking I can't go on. I, I just thought I'm going to find out about this. And every book I read, every book I picked up that promised in the blurb to tell me the truth didn't tell me the truth. They all either hid from the truth <clears throat> or they didn't know the truth. And I remember promising myself when I find the truth, I'm going to tell everybody. I'm going to tell everybody because there are other people out there just like me. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I triggered on, I triggered on the secret to the tree of life. You know, if you look at Kabbalah, the secret to the tree of life is that if we want abundance, we need to bring it down in order to share it. So if we can bring it down in order to share, it will be never ending. It'll be infinite. So I triggered on that by accident. If you show me what the truth is, I will share it with everybody. Um, and that, of course, this in, the environment heard me. It put me through all of this. I built a fear pyramid. I confronted all the things I was afraid of. My ultimate fear was the fear of violent confrontation. So I took a job as a bouncer. And I started to write about it. And I started to teach it. And as I went deeper and deeper, because when I started to question it, I, I remember talking to a couple of my friends and saying, are you fed up of kicking people in the head? Are you fed up of kicking people's teeth out? <clears throat> I kicked somebody's teeth out last night and he's, girlfriend was crying and crying and crying and trying to pick what was left of his face up in a white hanky i said this is this i don't care how you paint it it's, it isn't good that's somebody's sister that's somebody's wife you know that guy's got to go home to his kids and i just remember feeling sick and by and i said to my friend you know there must be more and i started to look for more and that you know again the environment heard me <clears throat> and he started to bring me towards metaphysics yeah, of course, these are monsters. They're all, they're all your own projections. They're all in you. The sickness is in you. Um, I started to be led to the different books, to better books, to not just the Waterstones front of shelf, but, you know, um, you know Blake and Milton and Dante. And then, uh, and then going, well, well, where are they getting their stuff from? Well, they got it from the Old Testament. They got it from the Gita. You know, they got it from the Nitnem, you know. So I go, well, let's go into them. And then you go into the Bibles and you go, you realize the Bibles are, are just the, the revealed works. There are hidden works. So you start studying the exegesis and then you're really, really, really inside. And then it's frightening because you're going, fucking hell, I've got, to, I've got so much shit in me that I've got to clean out. I want, I want to more consciousness. I want, to, I want more awareness. I want to be able to see more. I want to be able to understand more. Instead of using my hands to knock somebody's teeth out, I want to be able to use my hands to heal somebody.
instead of using my voice <clears throat> to frighten somebody, I want to be able to use my voice to deliver inspiration, to deliver aspiration. I want it to be didactic. You know, I want it to be intercessionary. I want people to listen to it and hear something beyond me, beyond this tiny little speck called Jeff Thompson. I want to be a channel for something bigger. And, it, and this voice is saying to me, you can do all that. You can have as much of me as you want. You've got to make room. You've got to win back your territories. You know, you've still got an addiction to sexual pornography. <clears throat> you're, still, um, you're still jealous. You're, you're still gossiping. You haven't even got control of your tongue. You think you're a big man. You haven't got control of your tongue. Someone beat the car at you, the, the car at you yesterday and pulled you out of centre. Where's your power? You know, you're frightened to let go of your right hand. You're frightened to let go of your knee waza, your judo. So we want to take you beyond that. We want to take you to a place where that's not necessary. Just your presence in a room will ripple out and act as a healing effect. So it's kind of saying you can have all of that. That's all available. But to get to that, you have to make room. You have to win back your own territories. You have to stop projecting out and saying it's his fault. It's her fault. It's their fault. It's the government. It's Donald Trump. It's all these people. You've got to come back and go, am I aligned? Am I congruent? You know, are the things in my life still that I don't want to see in the newspaper tomorrow? Are the th can I say I'm fully congruent? Until I can say I'm fully congruent, I've got no business worrying about what other people are doing wrong. The business is my own, re my own repentance. And my own repentance, I know that sounds biblical, the repentance is about me repairing, me returning back to my own centre, me returning back to my own autonomy, me returning back to my own will, me, like um, Odysseus, who comes back from the Trojan Wars to his kingdom at Ithaca to realise it's overrun. It's overrun by monsters and by vagabonds. And he's got a, he walks into his own kingdom and no, nobody even recognises him. <laughs> even his wife don't recognise him. It's a great allegory. Got to win his kingdom back. Odysseus is one of the, you know, it's one of, it's one of the great, great a a allegories about waking up and going, I'm awake, I'm in this kingdom, but I'm not in charge of this kingdom. I'm not even recognising this whole kingdom. I'm having sand kicked in my face every day by too much food, too much gossip, too much pornography, too much violence. Got to win this kingdom back. I want to I wanna at least get up in the morning and try and live like the saint. I fail every day. I, I know I do. I know I still fail every day. I still have things come into me that I'm working on, but that's, you know... I take um, solace from the fact that the saints, even at the level of sainthood, were, were still tripping up. It's, it's great that you've had so many epiphanies and you've got this wealth of knowledge to share with people. And I'm absolutely fascinated. I think I've read some of the similar books um, during my Arizona incarceration. But let's go back then and look at the trajectory because you said you didn't mind talking about your abuse. Yeah, yeah. Um, how long did the abuse last? And what were you like before it? And then how did it change you at that period? I would, I would, say, I would say that the abuse, the abuse was one night. Okay. <clears throat> that wasn't the damage, although that damaged me. <coughs> it was the year of grooming that changed me. That, that, that when it climbed inside me like a parasite, like a possession, and then this night of abuse by this guy that I idolised, um, and I've lost most of the night... I only know what I woke up to, but I've lost most of the night. I've never been able to retrieve it. I only remember this trauma waking up with my genitals all exposed and somebody feeling me and somebody, this weight. But, but the worst thing about it, Sean, was that my, I'm facing this way and I can feel it coming from behind me. I can't see. I'm too afraid to turn. All I keep doing is fighting this hand off. I wake up the next day and I'm 100 years old. This happened when I was 11. Um, and obviously I didn't realise at the time how much it damaged me because, you know, it, it might have only seemed like that much at the age of 11, but by the time I was 35, I was off the grid. I was stamping on people's heads. I was building myself into a monster. I'd got rid of all the pretty boy. I'd got a broken nose, two cauliflower ears. I was built like a battleship. I could kill in 30 languages, uh, but I was so insecure and so afraid and so psychotically jealous but you wouldn't have known it if you'd, if you'd have sat with me. You probably would have thought I was a nice guy and, and uh, articulate. 
But at my worst, if my wife left the room, I was sure she was, it was real. She was betraying me. And it wasn't just betraying me. It was, you know, it was um, visceral. It was like, it wasn't just like there's a romance going on. This was like, you know, cock sucking and, you know, all of the, all of the deepest, darkest pornography you can imagine. That's what in my mind, my wife was doing. Going back to the grooming then, because some people might watching this um, might want might, might be able to learn about the warning signs. What yeah. what methods were employed in your situation? The grooming was I was in it was in a martial arts class and and um, I was the star of the class and I followed this guy around like a puppy. I was a baby. I'd not hardly kissed a girl, so I, I had no idea about anything. He was obviously damaged. That wasn't known. I didn't know that at the time, and he. I, I'm in retrospect, I can see that he probably thought he was trying to develop a relationship. I was a child, you know. Um, so it was all how good I am. You're doing really good. And then it was like there's something special about you. You're special. Oh, special. Like Bruce Lee special. You know, like Ushaba special because Ushaba was like the head of Aikido. And I was like, oh, you know, I felt really good about this. So he started to, you know, invite me to do things. You know, we're, we're going to be fixing mats at the weekend. Come over and help us. And, you know, he would always put me out in the front of the class. He says, Jeff, look how amazing he's doing. Do that break fall again, Jeff. He would always call me out as the, you know. So it was all mostly that kind of thing. And then one day I said to him, when you sound special, what do you mean? He'd go, I can't tell you. I told somebody before and they didn't take it very well. But to me, it was still mysterious. It was still like... Um, this is the secrets, the martial arts. He sees something special in me. And of course, that's not what he meant. And then at this <clears throat> night of abuse, when I woke up, look, of course, in retrospect, you look back and you go, it's so obvious. You're my dad, kid, you're my, kid, though, you? my dad came down. My mom said, I don't, they, he, in the end, he said, come and stay overnight. We're going to be fixing all the Arkeda mats. Come and stay. I've written a play about it called Fragile, about the damage. Come and stay. And I was so excited. He said, we can sleep on the, you know, if you want to, you can sleep on the trampoline. He said, there can be loads of us here. We'll be sleeping all over the place. And I go, oh, wow, you know. So my mum didn't want me to go. Um, and she said to me, dad, you go down. And of course, my dad, um, I love his bones, but he, my dad was a drinker. So my dad came down with a drink in him um, and met the guy. And the warning signs were there as well. Because um, so I said to someone at the club, where is, where is, you know, where is he? I won't mention his name because he's dead now, but his family is still around. I wouldn't want to upset his family. But um, because I was, um, uh, he's, he's in the changing room. So I said to my dad, we'll go for the changing room. So I went into the changing room and my dad goes into the toilet to have a wee. Um, and this guy comes out of the shower um, and he's got a towel just, to, just here, just above himself. And he's holding it funny and he's looking at me funny. You know, and I'm thinking, I don't, I'm not reading it, but it, I know it's not right, but I'm not reading it. And then he hears the chain flush and he goes, who's that? And I go, oh, that's my dad. And he went, towel up, you know, suddenly started panicking, got chains, and it was all over my dad, nice to meet you, Mr. Thompson. And But my dad didn't see it. Nobody really saw it. You know, even people at the club denied it was going on, you know, but it was it was in plain sight. So this this was go this was the kind of thing that was going on. So it was mostly about think they start the playoff. In the play, it starts off by a guy who's so damaged that he's sharing his story with a tape recorder, and he doesn't even fucking trust the tape recorder. That's <laughs> <our day. laughs> At one point, he throws the tape recorder. If you want to, if you want to hear a blister, blister, blisteringly real monologue about the damage of abuse and how to exercise it, have a look at Fragile. But, um, so, yeah, the very beginning line is he says, you're special. You are special. That's what he said to me, you're special. Mm. And it was, uh, that stuck in my mind ever since. But after the abuse, uh, I went away from the club. Um, I must have buried it. I know, I know I woke up the next day and I woke up um, and it was like a, everyone was sleeping all over the place, but we got me in this little tiny room. Again, very suspicious. Nobody said anything. I don't, I don't really understand it. I wake up and he's, uh, I wake up and his mouth is touching mine. I wake up with his face touching mine. And there's the shock. And I know 
I know he's pretending to be asleep. I know he's pretending to have woke up like that, but his, his face is like that. But his face is so close to me that I can't kiss a girl for the next five years without that face. I mean, literally reappearing. I'm kissing a girl in the field, Julie Beach, my first girlfriend, you know, we're 12. And suddenly her face becomes a male face, mm. um, uh, bristles. Um, and the smell of a male face, a big face, and I can't kiss her or recoil, and she wonders what's going on. And then I start to physically abuse myself. And then I start like, to... Like cutting and stuff. Yeah, punching things, punching smashing things. things. Yeah. Then start to sexually abuse myself, but don't know I'm doing it. I don't understand it. I just... I, I, I realise in retrospect that I, I'd been possessed by this person, or you could say entangled. So even though we were disparate, and we were separated by time and distance, we were still as though we were the one thing. Still as a, So he was actually physically in me. That's what f ultimately forgiveness is about, getting that parasite out of you. So periodically for the rest of my life, right up until my um, 40s when I wrote Fragile, I was physically abusing myself. Phys this is all physical abuse. You know, what, what do you think all this is? This is saying, um, I'm not a girl. I'm not pretty. Don't look at me. I'm dangerous. I'm fucking dangerous. Stay away from me. That's an insecure person building a carapace to protect this child. So for um, uh, I, I wasn't even aware I was doing it. It was just that I'd got this life. I'd got, I was married. I'd got kids. My wife never knew about it, but I was sexually abusing myself as well. So I developed an addiction to pornography. My sympathetic nervous system could go like that. It would go. I'd, I would have a rush of um, passion. And again, I've written about this extensively in the play. If people want to go into it more. And I'd have to find somewhere to masturbate, somewhere quickly. I'd have to do it just to get it out of me. It was so powerful. And I started to physically rape myself as well. Anything phallic and I'd stick it in myself. And uh, forgive me if that's crude and people are watching with their Sunday people breakfast. People appreciate your honesty on this program. Well, I didn't know what I was doing. I only know that I would do it until I bled and then I would be filled with remorse and deep disgust and shame. And later on, when I really went into the study about it, into the psychology, I did a master's degree in psychology and started to study it. I recognized that part of my brain was trying to bring pleasure to the pain in order to rebalance. And partly I was just possessed. I just got this belief in me, and not just a belief, but a, 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 a semi-autonomous thought form that this guy had left in me. They call it in the in the in the New Testament or the Old Testament. They call it the hot coals. The, this is left inside you, so it's a parasitical force that fed this person, fed from it over and even in even in even though you you are disparate. So every time I physically or sexually abuse myself, every time I went into a place of misery or, uh, or self-disgust, um, and even more so because it was so secret, I wouldn't tell anybody about it, even my wife didn't know about it, um, this voice, the whisperer, in, in Islam they call them the whisperers, it would go, you're fucking disgusting. If your wife knew what you did, if your kids knew what you did, if your friends knew what you did, if they knew who you were, and it would I would be filled with shame. So I'd recognize that this parasite was feeding off my arousal. It was feeding off masturbation. And the masturbation was always extreme. And then it was feeding off the deep shame afterwards. So it was feeding three times. I recognized that the only way I was going to get this parasite out of me was to go past all the blame because I had a lot of anger towards my mom, a lot of anger towards my dad, a lot of anger towards the guy that abused me, a lot of anger at the world, a lot of anger towards anybody that came within my proximity or t tried to t control me in any way. <clears throat> I remember somebody trying to write over me once on a script, nothing. And I said to the producer, don't you fucking let that cunt, don't you let that cunt get inside my pants I said it I went well, I was nearly crying when I spoke to my wife I said he's written over me he's, he's written over me and I was I was so emotional Sean. He, he, I said he's written over me he's fucking he's coming he's written over me and and it was I didn't I couldn't see it because it was like 30 years apart and then the producers are thinking why are you reacting is why you just if you don't like him writing over you if there's an etiquette just say let's move on <clears throat> it wasn't writing over me 
It was controlling me. I was 11 again. I was 11. I was 11. I was 11 years old. So I had to, had to find this kid. <clears throat> in order to get to him, <clears throat> I had to go beyond all the blame. So in the play I write about, um, I, I explore it. I tell everybody what I think of them. And ultimately, I get to the point where I recognize that everybody did their best. Um, and everybody at some level was a victim and everybody at some level was damaged. But I wasn't really angry at them. I was angry at God. But I didn't want to say that. I mean, you can t imagine, I didn't want to say I was angry at my mum because I always felt my mum denied it. Didn't happen to you, you know, and they didn't do nothing about it. I, was always, I always felt that. So when I got to the point, when I, when I was able to explore that that blame and shout it out on the stage and say why did you do this and why did you do that I was able to get beyond it and recognize it was a placeholder it was a distraction it was like um it was like it was uh um it was like a way of hiding the core of it <clears throat> I was able to recognize that I had I just absolutely loved my mom and I loved my dad and I recognised that they'd done nothing wrong. And the teacher, I felt compassion for him because I recognised at some level he was a victim. Otherwise, he wouldn't be doing that kind of stuff. And he went and ended up killing himself. So, you know, as much as, as, much as what he did to me was heinous, he was a damaged guy and I felt compassion whether that's right or not. I just felt compassion. Before the compassion, how long did it take for you to realise he committed a criminal act. Uh, I guess when I started to work on the door, become a bouncer. In your twenties, then was it? Yeah, when into, into my twenties, I, I remember recognising he was still working at the same place. So I went to the police, reported it, and I said, "This happened when I was a kid. Uh, will you stand up in court?" I said, "Yeah, well, yeah." And uh, nothing happened. He didn't go anywhere. They said, the "Unless police didn't do anything with it." Well, they just said, "Unless we catch him in the act." They said, "We've been after him for years, but unless we catch him in the act." He said, he basically, his words were, unless we catch these paedophiles in the act, we can't do much. I know. Can you, can you believe this? Catch them in the act. We I can't know. do anything unless we catch them in the I act. Know. This is just the way. So all these people get in prison for low level drug offences, weed possession. <laughs> weed possession. And you've got to catch a paedophile in the act. Yeah. That is insane. He'd been working in this place for 30 years. I can remember talking to a boxing trainer there once, many, many years afterwards, and uh, after this guy had killed himself and uh, um, after being in the papers, and he just goes, well, I've worked there for years and I've never seen anything. And I said to him, he abused me. He groomed me. And he went, he said, what? I said, he abused me and he groomed me. And he said, what? So it was right in front of him and he'd never seen it. But I know people had seen it. I know I can tell by the reaction on people's faces. I knew people knew it was going on, but I just think nobody knew, knew what to do with it or how to get rid of it. Did you see the allegations appeared in the newspapers against yeah. him? Is that well, why he killed himself? What happened, what, the first thing that happened was I'd reached a point where um, I was starting to write about it. I was starting to talk about it and I was starting to explore forgiveness because I recognised that the violence was just... Um, was just making it more concentrated. The violence fed it. Any kind of pain, any kind of, any kind of suffering fed this pain body. It fed off pain. Eckhart Tolle would call it a pain body. And he says, pain bodies feed off pain bodies. Suffering feeds off suffering. So I recognised to go to another level. I to, in order to remove this parasite for me, I had to find another level. I had to trust in reciprocity. I had to understand Dharma, to understand that there was a law and that the law would... Um, uh, the law would balance its books with or without, with, with or without my witness. I didn't need to see the revenge. I needed to recognise in order to get rid of him, I needed to forgive him. But forgiveness in the sense of give him over to reciprocity, give him back. In the, the, um, the rabbis in the Old Testament would say that if you see somebody that's hurt you, see someone that's damaged you, run to him and try and serve him because he has something of yours and you need to get it back. And you'll only get it back if you, if you are kind, if you can find kindness or compassion. So he's saying that he has something of yours and you need to get it back. And when you get it back, you'll be able to give him back what he's given you. So there's an exchange. So when I finally met this guy in a cafe, when I was at my physical peak... This is the abuser? Yeah, I met him. I bumped into him, yeah. Well, just by chance? Serendipity. <gasps> I was starting to talk about forgiveness. I was starting to talk about Budo. I was starting to talk about, um, you know, higher levels of combat, internal combat. And again, this egregore, this, this being, this energy heard me, and it put me in a cafe opposite <sighs> him 
um, oh. when I was probably about 40. You're and I 40. remember looking across and, and uh, looking, and it was like a no man's land between me and him. It was like a, to go over, I'd have to climb out of a dugout with a bayonet. That's how I was terrified. I could feel the adrenaline from my soles of my feet to the top of my head. And I knew I had to go over. <clears throat> I was so emotional, I could have cried or lashed out. I didn't know what. But I knew at that time I was 16 stone, very physical, at the height of my powers physically. Did, you, did it flash in your head that you wanted to kill him? Yeah, of course, yeah. But I knew, I innately knew that if I did, I innately knew that if I did, I would never get rid of him. It would feed something in him and it would feed something in me <clears throat> and it would never go. I innately knew that I needed to give him over to reciprocity. Mm. So I went over. That's not easy though, is it? No, well, that's the whole idea. This voice was saying to me, you want hard training? You want it tough? You know how to do the physical stuff. You're falling over that stuff. You're doing it. You're doing it all around the world. It's easy for you. We want to take you to another level. We want to go to Budo. Budo means no arms. So I know what I've got to do, but I doubt whether I've got the ability to do it because I'm trembling. I'm 11 again. So anyway, I walk over. What's going through your head as you're walking over? Just, I could go away. No one would know. I could walk out. No one would know. No one would know I've seen him. But I, but I, but I knew I had to face it. And, and he had he not seen you? No, he didn't know who I was. He had no idea who you I was. Looked, you looked a lot different. I was like a little pretty girl yeah. last time he'd seen me. Yeah. So I went over and he was just looked up at me and I said, you don't remember me. And I said, but when I was a boy, I said, you abused me. And he went to stand up and I said, sit down. And it was, a, it was certainty. He felt certainty and he sat down. I said, you fucked me. You fucked my life. I said, um, and you need to know, I forgive you. I forgive you. I was telling my friend Gaz Banton this. Uh, Gaz is a, a sergeant major in the SBS. And he said, that's interesting that he said it twice. He said, when we went into battle we were in the SAS, he said, the one thing we always repeated was our mission, our mission statement. So we never forgot. If things fell apart and things went, you know, it was a shitstorm. He said, we always repeated the mission twice. So it was my repeating it twice was my certainty. I am not letting you off. I'm going to give you over to reciprocity. I'm breaking this feeding pipe between me and you. I'm going to take my will back, my autonomy, and I'm going to return the, uh, return the, 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 the burning coals. That's what they call it. It's a, there's a line from St. Paul. If thine enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap fires of coal on his head. And what it means is you take back your autonomy and you give him back the, the burning coals of abuse that he took from you. It's a literal thing. So that belief, you go, I don't believe this. I'm going to give it to you. When you offer food and drink, it's an allegory. It means you offer truth. I'm going to offer you truth. You're in my proximity. You're here. You are, you are in need of truth. You're hungry of truth. And I'm going to tell you the truth. You've rationalized what's happened to me and to all the other kids. You've, you've rationalized it. You've made it okay in your head. But the truth is, you fucked me. You damaged me. You damaged all these other kids. And that's not me you've got to deal with. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you deal with God, the universe, cause and effect, the law of retribution, the law of balance, whatever you want to call it. I trust it. I'm going to give you back to that. And I'm going to leave it with you. <clears throat> what was his body language like as you were talking to he him? He just shrunk. He was a big guy, but he shrunk. But I was so certain. Well, I said to you before about certainty comes from the word yakim. It means it's an attribute of God. He felt God in me. He felt certainty. Certainty is powerful. Certainty clears rooms. Certainty disappears anything. It is so powerful because you are getting, uh, it's like a hologram. You're getting a tiny, even though you've only got a tiny bit of it, it contains all of it. So the certainty made him cower. Was that after you forgave him? But yeah. prior to saying that, was he a bit on guard in case there was an altercation? It was. It was no. There was no sense that it was going to be an altercation. I was just certain that I had command of it. I was certain I had truth, and all I delivered was the truth. And that was what was. That was the burning coal. So I gave him back the parasite, and I took back my autonomy. And as I went to walk away, he stood up, and put his hand out, and his hand fingers were trembling. And he was, he was asking me to shake his hand. He was begging me to, to um, cement it, you know, accept it. So on one level, he was just saying, you know, um, please shake my hand as a, as a gesture of friendship. But on the other hand, he was saying, I accept your forgiveness. 
And, and that's a big thing. It wouldn't have been a conscious thing, but when somebody accepts your forgiveness, it means they let themselves be taken back to reciprocity. So he's basically saying, yes, I agree. We're going to sever this bond. We're going to sever this tie. You're giving me back the lie that I gave you. You're giving me back the damage I've, give, I've given you, and I'm giving you back your autonomy. And that's what I did. I took my autonomy back. And the autonomy is our own, the only thing we've got. It's our soul. It's our will. It's the only real thing we've got. It's our geometric point. It's the point where everything comes from. So I took back my autonomy and I gave him back his heart coals. And then I'll tell you the story. It's a very, very powerful story. In my head, I'm thinking, I've done that. Job done. That's ticked off. Move on. I don't want to talk about this again. I don't want to talk about the abuse again. I don't want to talk about all this stuff again. I'm tired of it. I'm at a film screen in London with the Shemazian brothers. And they've done a film called The Carriage Way. It's a short film. And it was amazing. And I remember looking at it and saying to my wife, uh, God, can you imagine what they do with a film of mine? You know, with one of my scripts. I said, they'd really do something with it. Anyway, we're getting to go. And the Shemazian brothers came over to me and said, would you write a film for us? And I said, uh, what have you got in mind? That handshake film. I said, what handshake film? In Watch My Back. You talk about meeting the abuser and you talk about shaking his hand. And I said, oh, you know, I said, I've done all that. I said, uh, I said listen, I, I, I automatically started to say, um, listen, get some money, raise some money. If you raise some money and commission me, I'll write it. But I don't really want to go back there again. So I went to my wife and, and I said, oh, they want me to write about the handshake. And uh, I said, I can't go back there again. And then I just remembered thinking, where is the, where, where is the, um, where's the power? Power's always, the power's always hidden in the fear. The power's always in the middle of the fear. The power is always contained in the kernel of the depression. It's always, it's always contained in the thing that you want to run away from. So I've, I've, I've made this habit in my life of turning towards the things I'm afraid of because I recognise the gold is actually hidden inside the fear. You just have to absorb it all before it will come out. So I go back to them and say, listen, I'll write it for you. I'll write that film. So I wrote a film called Romans 12.20, which is the quote I just said from St. Paul and his letters or his epistles to the Romans. But as I was writing the film, I finished the first draft. I was very nervous about it because I was thinking, oh, Christ, he's going to bring all this stuff out again. I've got to look at it. And I can see now what God was doing for me. He was going, you've done great. You've, you've broke that bond and he's gone, but you've still got residue in you. You've still got stuff in the plumbing. We need to pull all of this out. So he's like a pin in a crab shell. <clears throat> so I write this film. And the day I finished it, Sharon said, my wife said, have you seen what's in the paper? I said, what? And that guy that you who abused you, he's just been caught. He's been caught for a series of crimes in the 70s and he's going to court. And I said, wow, that's really weird. Well, in the film, I'd got my abuser. I'd, rash, I'd fictionalized it, but I'd got my abuser um, who, who killed himself after he's forgiven. So this guy gets you know, he, he's got to go to court. He's got a series of crimes, one against his own nephew. Um, or he had a disabled nephew. Um, mm. Anyway, about two weeks later, we're starting to cast. And I'm talking to a guy on the phone whose son was interested in playing the part in Romans 12.20. Romans 12.20 is online if anybody wants to watch it. They can go and watch it. It's free. Um, and I was talking to this guy who knew nothing about this, my abuser, knew nothing about him. And he just said, oh, did you see in the paper so-and-so? Because uh, this guy was well known in the city. And he killed himself, saw himself in London. So I'd written this, I'd written in the film that he killed himself. And then as, when I wrote the film, he actually wow. killed himself. So you've given an analysis of the handshake as a future person looking back at it. You yeah. broke that down excellently. What I'm interested in is at that moment in time of the handshake, when you saw that hand sticking out, did you did it repulse you, or were you instinctively thinking that the right thing to do was shake his hand? What what actually went through your head at that moment? It was I was certain, Sean. I knew. It was certain. I knew that if I didn't shake his hand, it yeah. wasn't complete. Yeah. I needed to I needed to be certain that I wanted to break this bond, yeah. and I needed to trust in reciprocity. Reciprocity is a scientific law. 
with every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. They call it the law of compensation. I, I understand reciprocity because I've been a violent man and I've watched every one of my crimes come back to me. I've watched them like a, like a karmic boomerang come back to me and I've watched all of my friends meet their own reciprocity. I can't hide from reciprocity. So I had enough knowledge of reciprocity to trust that if I let this guy go, I didn't know what would happen. I just knew that he would have to face whatever he's done at some point. And I didn't need to witness it. Some people do need their day in court. Some people need to demand an apology. Some people need to go to the police. Although you can do all those things as well. Forgiveness is about letting go of the anger, letting go of the hate, letting go of the dissonance. Ultimately, it's about letting go of, it's about letting go of the, the, the burning coal of lie, of mistruth that's planted inside you. It's literally, a, I always say that abuse is a possession and forgiveness um, is an exorcism. It's literal. It's not, you know, it actually is a semi-autonomous thought form that resides inside you and feeds off all the misery it can bring to you. So at the time, I just knew that if I didn't shake his hand, like Siddhartha says, you know, um, you, I don't know if you've ever read Herman Hess. He did a book called Siddhartha about, about the Buddha before he became enlightened. He said, if we, don't, if we don't meet our fears and see them through to their end, we'll have to go back and do it all over again. And I just, I just can't do that. So I thought, I've got, to, I've got to finish this. It doesn't matter to me that people don't understand what I'm doing. I understand. It doesn't matter that people think I've let him off. I know that I've dealt him the, 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 the hardest blow. True revenge is when you forgive because you're giving them, you're separating themselves, you're separating them from you and you're giving them over to reciprocity. It's the ultimate power. But you have to have a, enough understanding of reciprocity to trust it. And most people don't do the rigor on reciprocity. They just think people get away with things. But nobody does. Nobody escapes the human condition. Nobody ex escapes causality. Nobody does. I know that firsthand because I've done so many things wrong. So I knew if I didn't shake his hand, I knew <laughs> I'd have to go back and do it all over again. Wow, what a powerful story this is. All right, going back to the early years, then you said, you know, problems with trying to kiss a girlfriend at yeah. a young age. You mentioned the insane jealousy. Did relationships normalize for you at some point? It was two lives. And I never knew this until retrospect. At the time, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know what was going on. There was two lives. There was, there was my normal life where I'm, uh, um, you know, uh, a, a husband working in a factory, sweeping floors. Uh, working in a chemical plant, got beautiful kids, uh, training in karate, uh, trying to build myself up physically, <clears throat> know that I'm afraid of something, um, but don't really understand what. But I'm also aware that I'm also aware that just beyond my grasp is this, this infinite potential. I'm stuck in a terraced house, in a shitty job, in an unhappy marriage, and I know there is, I know there is freedom out there. And I, and I know that, but I can't reach it because I'm too afraid. Because every time I go to the periphery of my boundaries, I'm knocked back by terror and then by depression. And it kicks, kicks sand in my face and says, don't ever go to the edge again because you're not good enough for the edge. You have to, I had to learn to eat fear. I had to learn to absorb fear. Like Ushaba says, you have to absorb 99% of it before it gives up the ghost. So I, would, I was just this ordinary guy who wanted to expand and, and do more, but I had no control of my will. So running alongside my life was the physical abuse. So I'd go, I'd, I'd go from rolling around the house and, be, you know, kind of a little bit bipolar to, um, you know, to smashing furniture up to, you know, into matchsticks because of this volcanic temper. And then if, there, if any little change in my life, tiny little changes, if we've got a new guy working with us, it would trigger um, fear in me. It would trigger anxiety in me because I just couldn't cope with change. I couldn't cope with anything that threatened my security, anything that made me feel as though um, somebody might take advantage, even though I didn't link it to the abuse. Anything that threatened my safety, my security, filled me with anxiety. I managed to work and I managed to, continue to work through these depressions but it was a very miserable way to live it was only when i had this one final depression and we were talking about the sexual abuse the self self abuse on myself that was just done privately that was done when nobody was looking and i wasn't aware of what i was doing i just thought i just thought um i 
I just thought it was a depraved part of me. I thought I was depraved. And of course, I would have the, these lusts, this self-abuse, and then this tremendous shame afterwards. All of it was feeding on me. And it would, I might feed on me for a month, and then I'd be away, and then I'd go, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to get away from all that. Then it would capture me again. And I'd find myself running to look at pornography. I'd find myself running to sexually abuse myself. And then afterwards, going through that same cycle, but no control of it. It was definitely like a possession. So that was going on all the time. And I didn't link it to anything else. It was only when I had this final depression um, and I was debilitated by it. And it was just feels like the, the world was going to end. And I felt like I was being assailed from every angle. I just remember finding rage from somewhere. Bump. I just went, I've had enough. That's enough. I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm fucking tired of living like this. Please forgive my swearing. But that's, how I, that's what I said. I'm tired of living like this. So I said to this depression, come in, have a sit down, have a cup of tea, stay as long as you want. Stay as long as you want. Every time I tried to run away from it, it got fat on me running. Every time, every time I begged and cowered and tried to scrub it out of my body, it got fat on my pain. So I just said, come in, sit down, have a cup of tea. Do you want to meet my wife? This is the conversation I had in my head. Stay as long as you want. I didn't realise until 30 years later that was the technique St. Francis used. That was the technique that Milarepa used. When Milarepa, the great Buddhist saint, murderer turned saint, was assailed by four demons in his, um, in his cave, um, he tried every magic trick to get them out and he wouldn't go. So in the end he goes, oh, well, stay then. Boom. As soon as he didn't care... It was a technique used by that psychiatrist who survived Auschwitz as well. I think he called it paradoxical intention. Yeah, Viktor Frankl. Yeah. Viktor Frankl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. paradoxical stuff. intention. The thing yeah, you're yeah. afraid of, invite it in. Just curiosity. We go, oh, that's feeling again. There's that depression again. Let's not cover it with tablets. Let's not cover it with a blanket or alcohol or sex. Let's just have a look at it. Let's follow it a little bit. It's got, I notice it's got its own voice. I notice it speaks to me. It's, it's, got, it's got a sub-vocalisation. Let's have a look at that. The moment you notice that it, you, the moment you, it notices that it's been noticed, it goes, oh, I've been noticed. If you get a chance to read Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, yeah. it's the best book in the world at the moment on this technique. It's the best book on identifying pain bodies, semi-autonomous thought forms, and how to dissolve them by not engaging them, by not identifying with them, by building an eye wall and observing he calls it the observer self. So I, I had this tremendous rage and this, oh, I'm tired of running from you, come and have a sit down. And as soon as he did that, it lessened. And then with this rage came an idea. I would say this is my first communication with my soul. So I got this seed of an idea fell into my mind. I'm going to draw a pyramid on a piece of paper. I'm going to write down everything I'm afraid of. Least fear on the bottom step, worst fear on the top step, and I'm going to confront them systematically. I'm going to get desensitized to the feelings of adrenaline. I realized I wasn't really afraid of things. I was afraid of the feelings that the things brought up in me. So I thought if I can get desensitization to the feelings, then I won't be afraid anymore. So the moment I started to turn into my fears, they scattered like cats. Ushiba said, again, I read this many years later, he said... Fear is an illusion, but it'll hold its form until you absorb 99% of it. He said, when you absorb 99% of it, he said, this three-dimensional monster will become a two-dimensional cartoon and it will dissipate. But you have to be prepared to sit in that feeling until it dissipates. And then when it dissipates, it gives you the kernel of gold. It gives you the message. So when I sat in this, this idea came through, build a pyramid, climb the pyramid, um, and when you've done that, share it with people. I wrote a book called Fear, the Friend of Exceptional People about this technique that I'd found. I just found it, it just dropped into my head. So I started to, as soon as I started to confront the fears, the depression just went. Because I suddenly, uh, he's suddenly like, well, he's got the message now. He's, he's, you know, we're not a harbinger of doom, although we will claim him. You know, if he doesn't, if he doesn't claim us, we'll claim him. We'll absorb, we'll absorb him. We'll take over this body, we'll possess him. But if he doesn't, then <clears throat> we'll just scoot off. So I started to confront these things. Every time I confronted a fear and got desensitized to it, the nature of the fear was liberated, 
And the effulgence that was locked in the fear, that little nugget of gold, came over to me. So every time I overcame a fear, my awareness ex expanded, my understanding expanded, my courage expanded, and my wisdom ex expanded. I started to get certainties. Certainties are gold. People will travel across the world to touch the hand of certainty because certainty is an experiential thing. It isn't something you're going to get in a vision or from a flash. It's something that you have to go out and experience. And, you, and when you've got it, it's, um, it's, if you want to, it's something you can sell, something you can put into a book, something you can, you, you know, you can teach your certainty to other people. They won't, they won't get certainty from it, but it will lead them to find their own certainty. So I started to um, confront these fears, and I recognized that the fears I was confronting were placeholders. Below them there were deeper fears. So I started to build an inner pyramid. So I started to recognize I was afraid of my wife. I was afraid of marital confrontation. I was afraid of my mum. I was afraid of, even as an adult, of having a tattoo in case my mum found out. <laughs> I, was af I was afraid of change. I talked about success and I bored people with my talks about success. And I bored them because I wasn't doing nothing about it. But I didn't know what success was. I was afraid of success. I recognized success, success meant change. It meant rigor. The moment I looked at success, he said, OK, give me your schematic. What is it that you want to do? I spoke to a guy recently, a down and out kid. I sat and had a cup of tea with him and I just said to him, what would you like to do? He goes, I'd like to, you know, big industry, big industry, give people jobs. I goes, oh, that's amazing. I said, so what's, what's the detail? He goes, uh, yeah, you know, big industry. And I said, but what, what, what would you like to do? What in? you know, engineering or design or... And he goes, I don't know, just... I just... I don't know. He didn't... He, he, he was like me as a kid. He got an idea of success and of money, <clears throat> but he didn't understand what it meant. He didn't understand how to get that. He didn't un understand how to improve himself. <coughs> so I started to... He started to force me to study. It's, I became an autodidact. I started to really study. I started to read books. I started to place myself into situations to get real knowing. That's why I went on the door. You know, I would got my, all my certainties from this fear pyramid. I stood up to my wife. I changed jobs. I put myself from a factory sweeping floors to uh, becoming a, a bricklayer. I, you know, in my late 20s, I learned to become a bricklayer. Then I stood on a nightclub door. So suddenly this kid that was a, afraid of life was afraid of living suddenly this kid was standing on nightclub doors and handling life and death situations um and that gave me the confidence to start writing about it and teaching it and because there was a truth there and a certainty it spread very quickly but it also gave me it gave me the belief that anything was possible if it's possible for me to do this when i thought it wasn't possible um then it's possible for me to do other things like become a writer if it's possible for me to write a book, it's possible for me to write a, a play. Why not? It's possible for me to write a, a film. Why not write a film and get Ray Winston in? Why not, why not do a feature film? Why not do a feature film and get Orlando Balloon to play it? You know, why not go and have tea in Las Vegas with Chuck Norris? Let's go and have tea in Las Vegas give us, with give Chuck Norris. Give us that story. What's it like arriving <laughs> with, in the Chuck Norris camp? <laughs> I sabotaged it. I, tried, I was so scared of going, even though I was doing really well and I was working the doors and and uh you know if I even though I was working the doors and all the rest of it uh, you know I was doing really well when I got the call to go to America I, I innately knew it was a call to the world stage because he invited so few people over there and he was so iconic how did he find out about you how did that call come about watch my back oh the book I got noticed yeah. you put things out there you'll notice that book went it's rippled out to Australia got picked wow. up by a guy called John Will who's a legendary Brazilian jiu-jitsu player he loved it he gave it to a guy called Richard Burton who was a who was an Australian film uh, uh, action movie star friends of Chuck Norris he was trained with Chuck Norris in America so we took it to Chuck Norris Chuck Norris goes I like this I like this stuff about fear I like this stuff about posturing I like the preemption I like the honesty of this so they just invited me over but I was so afraid to go um, that I sabotaged it I just said I'll come but you know you'll have to I need a Yuki. I need a partner. Yeah, we'll pay for a partner. Uh, well, you know, it's no good me coming to Las Vegas for four days. I'd need to be there for at least 10 days, you know, because it's too far. And they said, yeah, we'll pay for 10 nights in a hotel. And I said, well, this is my fee. And they go, yeah, we'll pay that. I'd know I couldn't run anywhere. 
But of course, you go. You, I made it into this monster, and when I got there, it was just lovely people in a room. Five hundred, I guess, five hundred of the top black belts in America, and there were just people that were very, very keen to to listen to your certainties. And it was great. I sat with Chuck Norris having tea and he was telling me about when Bruce Lee used to ring him up and say, do you want to come and spy? you want to come around and do a bit of spy? It was so strange. How did Describe actually the first time you met him then when you got there. First time I met him, I've been, I got invited three times. But the second time I went, um, I, one of my students was um, a, a policeman in the LAPD. He was a long, long distance student. And he came along and uh, he was a very established guy he was like he was like the chief instructor of self-defense in the lapd um and he was a very beautiful guy called lito angeles and he said i brought him along t- uh, to help me as well and he said uh, when i meet chuck norris i'm going to say this and i'm going to tell him that and i'm going to say this to him and i'm going to ask him about that anyway we were sitting having having dinner and uh, chuck norris come around and shook my hand and gave me a hug and i said oh this is my friend lito he's a he's a, an instructor at the lapd and lito went Literally nothing came out, nothing, it was nothing. <laughs> so um, he just shook his hand and said, nice to meet you, Lito, you're doing a really good job. That was the, first, that was the second time, yeah, yeah, that was the second time. The first, yeah, that was the first time. The second time was when I sat with him and uh, I did an interview with him. I was writing for the men's mags at the time. I was a columnist on men's fitness and I was writing for Loaded and, you know, FHM and stuff like that. And I sat with him and did an interview with him for, uh, for Loaded and uh, he was really, really lovely. He was saying, listen, anybody could do this. He said, people put you in a, in a situation, a position. He said, but I only took up martial arts, he said, because I had a stutter. He said, and I was insecure. So I took up martial arts. He said, I didn't re- realise I'd become three times world champion. Then he talked to me about Bruce Lee and how they used to spar together. And he said, then Bruce Lee went into the films and he said, uh, he called me up one day. He said, do you want to take a starring role in one of my films under a film called The Way of the Dragon? And he said, ah, you want to beat the world champion on, on screen, do you? <laughs> so he just said, uh, and an interesting thing, he said, um, after Bruce Lee died, he said there was a big gap in the action movie films. He said, and there was two people could have took it him and a guy called Joe Lewis. Um, Joe Lewis was a very legendary martial artist in America. He said, me, he said, I'm keen. He said, I want to sweep floors. I want to make tea. I don't care. I just want to be on set. Joe Lewis is saying, I want this. I want that. I won't come unless you give me the other. He said, and I ended up getting all the slots and Joe Lewis fell away. No one heard of him again. But he was so humble. He was so lovely. But he kept saying to me, anybody can do this. This is possible. Tell your readers that this is possible. if They want to do these kind of things. So I was teaching with the Graces. I was teaching with the Benny Akides <coughs> or the Machados. Um, uh, my but Benny Akides, again, another legendary martial artist. His wife um, is the great, great, great granddaughter of Geronimo. And she sat there. I've never met her before. She sat there with a hand on my neck all through dinner. She's a shaman, and she's telling me about this spirit behind you, that spirit behind you. This spirit is telling you what's going to happen next. And it was, she passed this shamanic message on to me. Um, and... Benny was sat there, my wife was sat here, and she sat with a hand on my neck all through dinner telling me um, what my spirit guides were telling me. And it was, it was fascinating. And most of the things she said have, have come to pass. You know, things like you're just going to keep expanding and things are going to keep improving. You're going to, you know, you're going to be attacked. Um, and sometimes the attacks came from outside and more often than not, they came from inside. They came from internal... You know, you know, you talk about individuation, bringing the unconscious into the conscious, things that were coming through me that I had to let go of. Most of my battles were with them, you know. So, yeah, going to Las Vegas and teaching for Chuck Norris was amazing. But more so because when I came back, I had this moment of clarity. Everything just expanded. I just woke up in the middle of the night and I felt connected to everything. <coughs> Excuse me. I just felt God. And I said to my wife the next morning, have a guess who I saw last night. And she said, who? I said, God. And she said, oh, lovely. What do you want for breakfast? <laughs> and I think if it wasn't for her, I might have floated off into the ether. Because I was, <laughs> I, I was high for two years, Sean. Mm. High. I was impervious. I was floating. I felt oneness. They call it in, in esoteric practice, they call it the honeymoon period. I had two years of bliss where everything I touched was gold. And then, you know, then I got the message... Okay, so you've forgiven this guy 
Um, you've gone to Las Vegas, you've overcome your fears, you've made room, you've expanded, you're aware of so much more, but there's still a lot of shit in the plumbing. There's still a lot of crimes you've committed that you haven't paid for. You know, you've been violent for nearly 10 years. You've hurt people. You've had affairs. Um, you've been a bully. Um, and we know it's a displacement from what happened to you, but you, you still did it. And that needs to be looked at. So I went through a 10-year a period of... Uh, um, painful atonement I've, the, I've written a book called notes from a factory floor which i go into the whole that whole arc of what happened and what atonement means and what repentance means and how it literally brought me to my knees you know i can remember at one point begging for this to be taken out of me begging i was you know this very powerful physical man was suddenly you know just i was um empty I mean, literally, it was a kenosis. I was completely emptied. And then I was built back up again. But I had to, I had to purge. I had to get all of this stuff out of me. You can't just be violent and then go, oh, I've had an epiphany. I've had a moment of clarity. I'm not going to do that anymore. That's still done. That karma is still there. It needs to be paid. So repentance, and they say that the, the, the journey back is always the hardest. So I had to return to the centre. In order to return to the centre, I had to dig up all those dead bodies. I had to resurrect them. I had to look at them. I had to let them have their say. Um, and it was painful to see what an ugly, violent, base man I became. But not the man I am now. Well, you know, in order to, to feel what I feel now, which is love and compassion and potential, infinite potential. And you radiate that and your spiritual and philosophical knowledge is really advanced. And I think you're an opportunity to help some of the people watching this today. I want to give them some advice from you on how to deal with certain situations. I'll, I'll give you a little story first yeah. of something I learned from some black belts in, in, um, down south in my club. So I, I was out of prison, in prison. Um, you know, if someone challenges you, you have to step up. Otherwise... You're a punk, basically, and everyone's going to prey on that weakness. Yeah. So I was used to that. You know, if someone's going to get in my face, I've got to do, say something back or do something. So go out with the sensei and the other black belts in, um, to watch some fight in London. We're coming back, get off the train. It's about 11, 12, something like that late. And we're walking over a bridge, and the black belts are all just talking amongst each other. And a gang of drunks is approaching us on the other side of the bridge and they're screaming and one of them just kicks a can at the black belts and goes come on motherfuckers so now i'm triggered because i'm thinking right in prison you've got to do something about this otherwise you're, you're viewed as weak yeah the black belt conversation didn't even stop didn't even like get off the what they were talking about they just walked through those drunks like ghosts, as if they didn't exist. Yeah. And this is messing with my head now, thinking, what? These tough guys didn't react to that. But then I realized the lesson in that. So people out there right now, I, I would have asked you about getting verbally and physically challenged, but in particular, it's online as well right mm. now. How do you advise people to react to people provoking them? Physically, verbally, and online? Well, the moment we the moment we project out there, <clears throat> we're in, we're in the shit. It's a shit storm out there, and you're not going to fix it. And you you know, there's too many people. There's too many things to go at. So what you do is you come back to the center. You bring yourself back to the very center. You've got to find out who you are. You've got to find the the your own singularity. So in other words, you got, they call it apophatic theology. It sounds fancy, but it just means finding the self through negation. So we get rid of all of the parts of ourselves that aren't real, that aren't us. We get rid of the anger. We get rid of the judgment. We get rid of the, um, you know, the unqualified opinions, the gossip. We get rid of the excesses, the pornographies. We reduce ourselves so much that our consciousness has no choice but to expand. When the consciousness expands, we create a proximity that just doesn't attract violence. It's not in us. So they call it the magic bowl in, in Tao. So they say, this is the magic bowl in the Dan Tien here. What comes out of there is powerful. It's impressive. It can become something. It can become anything because there's an energy comes from there. But what goes into the magic bowl is disappeared forever. So this is Eckhart Tolle's thing. If we do nothing, 
if we find a space in the center, if we find that singularity, everything that's not balanced will disappear into it. So things come towards us and they're conceptualized. This is a good person, this is a bad person. This is a good situation, this is a bad situation. Uh, concepts have forms and forms have aspects. So the form is aggression and the aspect is well, I'm going to be aggressive with you. If we're able to bring that to denotation, take away the concept, all we're left with is um, superposition. It's an energy that hasn't got a concept and that can become something or nothing. So if we don't engage it as a concept, it will eventually just disappear into that vacuum. I'm talking about high level training. But like I look at you, I look at what you do now, and you do it beautifully, and you've got a massive following. Um, and I know that that didn't come without, I think you mentioned 12 years, but that, com that comes with, um, your knowing comes from thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of practice. So this technique I'm talking about, the magic bowl or stillness or, or deconceptualizing something or, or denotation, um, that knowing comes from thousands of hours of practice. It's not something that's going to be handed to you on a plate. But a good place to start will be um, Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now. I've done a book called The Divine CEO as well, which is, um, which is my whole, a whole book on how to align to divinity, how to be internally congruent. So the job, in, in simple terms, what I'm saying is, don't worry about the world. Don't worry about what's going on out there. Just concentrate on you. Know, on you. Like I said to my wife once, the, this guy on the television said he's driving me fucking mad. He's criticising films all the time. He's destroying them. She says, well, he's no different to you. And I go, so he's nothing like me. And she says, well, you criticise films. This is about 20 years ago. And I said, no, I don't. She said, we come out of the cinema last week and you were criticising the film. She said, this guy's just got the balls to do it on television. And I went, she said, what is it about this guy that you don't like in yourself? It was just classic projection. So it's saying the world is a mirror. The world will show you where you need to work, but you won't. If you go at the cinema and there's a film on at the cinema and, and, and the screen is a bit, you know, the picture's a bit shit or it's a horror film or you don't like it, you, won't, you wouldn't try and change it at the level of the screen. You'd go back to the projector or you go into another cinema house. So if we want to change the world, we have to change yourself. It's very literal. So we have to come in, we have to look at our perceptions, our beliefs, our cognitions, our concepts, our precepts, all of these information we've got we have to go to war with them and change it and as we change ourselves, as we clean ourselves, as we win our territories back the world will start to change so at the moment if you want to see where you are and you want to see what your state of balance is have a look at what's immediately around you have a look at what you wake up with have a look at what your online viewing is have a look at what your online comments are have a look at what kind of criticism you're getting and if it's not in you it won't touch you so all of those things are secondary. While we try and fix those, we're never going to fix ourselves. While I try to fix the film at the level of the screen, nothing's going to change. So I've got to come back to the projector. The light coming through the projector, Sean, is perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's coming through um, images, filters, beliefs that can be changed. All of them can be changed. But we're talking about a lifetime's work. We're talking about Budo. And we're not talking about an easy fix. You may be in a place where at this moment in time you need to be physical to survive. But at least if you're curious about this internal work, there are teachers out there that will race towards you. They get credits for teaching you. The, the, vi the visible teachers and the invisible teachers get credit for passing this information on. So the moment you want to be curious and start learning to live better, those teachers will appear in the form of a podcast, in the form of a, a book or, a, or, a, or something on a film. God is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, so he'll speak to you through the Sunday tabloids if you, if you want to find him there. He's everywhere. There's nowhere that this energy is not. So I would say work on yourself. Take your clothes off, look in the mirror, Am I aligned? Is my body in shape? Have I got control of my, my um, sympathetic nervous system? Have I got control of my sensual body? Can I qualify the opinions I'm telling everybody in the pub? Can I qualify, you know, um, can I control myself? Can I stop myself from destroying a friend over a coffee and got by, by gossiping about him? How powerful are we? You know, what am I without this big right cross? What am I without my money? What am I without the wealth?
What's what if all that's taken away? What's left? We need we need to be that. What's left is a fucking powerful vortex that can heal everything it touches. That's worth getting out of bed in the morning for. But we start with the self. We don't let ourselves distract and start trying fixing everybody else. It's no good. I think Richard Rose said, it's no good walking around London with a placard while we still can't wipe our own arse. So (laughs) what I'm taking from that then is you've got to clean your own house to not be attracting as much of that confrontational energy. Absolutely. And... You know, the inner journey never ends. You've got um, Jeff's books. You've got Eckhart. Take time for introspection. You've got all this time on your hands right now while you're doing lockdowns. Have you done any TED Talks? Yeah, I've got a TED Talk about fear and forgiveness, yeah. Ooh, watch, watch Jeff's TED Talk. Now, so... If I simplify it, I'd just say be kind. Be kind. If it doesn't come from kindness, you've got no business there. So if so- someone gets in your face... Well, let's, let's come back before that. Let's come back before that. Why is somebody in my face? Yeah. You know, if I'm on a, if I'm on a bus and a fight kicks off, I want to know what's wrong with my proximity for that to happen around me. If, I, if my car is parked outside my house and someone runs into the back of it and I'm in the house, the first thing I go to is me. Where am I, where am I out of alignment? Okay, let's go back to the bridge story then. So I'm with the black belts walking over the bridge. The drunks kick the can. Come on, motherfuckers. Fuck you, motherfuckers. I've got my reaction. They've got a completely different reaction. What, what are they telling themselves at that point in time? Why, why is their reaction different? Because they've got a certainty that you haven't. Your, your certainty comes from a different place. Your, your certainty comes from a very real place yeah. uh, where, you know, where, where there's a belief that if you don't physically look after yourself, you're going to be damaged. But what I'm saying is if you have, a, if you have an absolute centre, mm. um, nothing will be able to get in. Nothing will be able to get in at all. Yeah. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. I'm not saying because, you know, um, uh, monkeys fall out of trees. We make mistakes. What I'm saying is we train ourselves to the point where um, we don't attract that into our life. Someone said to me recently, oh, yeah, I was on the bus and I got on the bus and, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't going to wear a mask on the bus. So I don't want to wear a mask. And uh, a fight kicked off. And they said I ended up having to get in between these two people. And he, and he was talking about it like, you know, this situation happened and uh, I, I ended up being a peacemaker. And I'm saying, what I want to know is why is a fight kicking off in your proximity? Why, why is the fighting in your proximity? What is there in your life that you're not looking at that has to, that has to manifest as a fight before you look at it? The, 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 our surroundings are constantly giving us information about what we need to work on. It's constantly trying to get us back to homeostasis, which is our natural balance. So it's not about going, well, in this situation, I could have said this or I could have done that because every situation is different. What I'm saying is if you fix the center, work on fixing the center, those things won't happen in your life. And it's no good even saying, but, but if they did, you've still, have, would you still use that? And would go, I don't even envisage it happening. I don't see it happening. We make mistakes. And if we make mistakes and we suddenly find, honestly, the, the immediate thing I ask myself, if there's any kind of negativity in my environment, the first thing I ask myself is where am I out of alignment? My will has to be won on a daily basis. I have to keep my kingdom, I have to keep my, my, uh, my center every single day. It's the same as anything else. If I don't maintain it, it's going to fall away. So I have, to, I have to fight for that balance every single day. I have to fight for my will every single day. So the first thing to do is if, you know, like if, if we don't like the corrupt politicians, is there any parts of us that are still corrupt? Are there any parts of us that are still dishonest? Are there any parts of us, you know, you know, are we, are we kind of, uh, are we the store manager that's very hard on, on the pilfering thieves, but we, but we take a Mars bar off the shelf every night when we go home and don't pay for it? You know, are we quietly criminals ourselves in our own way? You know, are we hate, are, do we hate the fascists in the world, but we're, we're still a fascist in our own house? We still bully our wife if she doesn't want sex. We slam doors and we give her a cold back in bed and we're monosyllabic because she doesn't want sex. That's violence. It's the first level of violence. So we can, we, can, we can hate the fascists in the world, but be a fascist in our own life, in our own body. So it's always about coming back to working on the self. So and you've, the, you've, yeah. made me, you've made me um, think about the bridge situation more deeply and come to perhaps a conclusion then. Let me just run this by if yeah. this is correct. Walk over the bridge, they shout at us, and I think an enemy has manifested that we've got to do something about. Whereas the black belts 
go over, conversation doesn't skip a beat, enemy doesn't exist. So the enemy only exists if you acknowledge it. Is that true? And your yeah. enemy should just not exist. Don't acknowledge them. If people just get in your face trolling, whatever, don't acknowledge they don't exist. Is that the best But that's way? a place. I mean, that's quantum again, is isn't it? Is that the mature? Yeah, that's quantum again. You know, energies are, are, are changed by our observation of them. Yeah. You know, they will, they will form according to our observation. If we're observing them from a place, from a concept of enemy, we've got an enemy, we'll have a fight, and we'll be able to justify it, probably even in a law, court of law. But on a metaphysical level, you know, we're the ones that are determining what something is. Our observation of it will determine what it is. So if we're able to find that place of stillness and centre, it will be absorbed, it will be disappeared, or it won't even appear in the first place. If it does appear, it's the first sign that we're out of balance and we bring ourselves back to alignment again. To help young people then, there's young people out there who are getting trolled and they're committing suicide. They, they react to it, to it, they get sucked yeah. into it, yeah. empower it, and it has this hold over them and, they, and yeah. they commit suicide what would you say to someone in that situation well i'd want i'd want to know why they're online if that if they're constantly getting all that you know why are they online why are they putting themselves in front of it you know why are they there because you know they've got to, you've got to look at what that's feeding in you what is it feeding because obviously when you when you're the way kids live these days isn't but, it they're but, online but all the time they are but they don't have to be yeah. so you know we're at, we're, at, we're actually asking them to we're at, actually asking them to question everything so we're actually ask, asking them to find out who they are. Because who they are isn't the kid that wants to commit suicide. Who they are, that, that's a parasite. That's something that's been placed in them by a suggestion. Maybe it's been in them for a long time since they were a kid. I'm saying that find your own centre. You know, you don't have to be online if you don't want to be online. People say you need to be and they've got all of these different ideas about what about being online means and they've all got different ways of dealing with it but if you don't want to be online it doesn't exist where is it now it's not here with us now it isn't in this room you know you asked me before about what kind of comments i'd got from some of the other talks i've done i don't know um someone else said to me i hope you've looked online and looked at some of the great comments you've on i don't i don't go online and do that i've not I can't say i've never have but it's just not something i indulge you detached because if i go in and look at the good stuff that's okay that that's masturbation if i look at the bad stuff it's unkind <laughs> but it really is isn't it listen, yeah, I, listen, yeah. I, I feel as though i'm um i it's feel as hard though, to implement that i feel as though i'm a postman um, I'm delivering cards and letters and I'm hoping that they'll, they'll land with people and they'll, uh, they'll make a difference. But they're not from me. They're coming through me. I'm just a, I am just a vessel. So if I'm looking at the good comments and thinking they're great, then I'm taking credit for something I haven't done. Even my books, believe me, I just get in the way of them. I'm very disciplined. I can sit down. But the stuff that comes through, like the notes from a factory floor or... or um, um, this other one, The Divine Seer, they're beautiful books. I know they're beautiful, but I know, I know I had nothing to do with them other than that they came through me. They picked up my flavours. They picked up my stories, but I can't write that good. You know, The Divine CEO, 20 chapters downloaded in my head when I was on a walk. They came so fast I had to write them down and send them to myself. <laughs> and then when I sat down, it wrote itself. 150,000 words in six weeks, 300,000 words in 12 weeks, the two books. It just came through me like, as a force. So I don't take credit for it. I don't need to go online and take the credit or the criticism because none of it's mine. You're not, you're not criticizing me. You're not complimenting me. I can't say that it doesn't catch me because I'm human. But what I'm saying is I've, I've reduced my life so that I, I don't have an online presence other than an Instagram account that my friend Gabriella runs for me. I don't have an online presence. I've reduced it so I don't have to make money. I, I want to just be able to constantly 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 expand and learn so that i can be a better vessel for this sound that comes through so that so that i can the more the more I, and it's not just about being a great bloke i'm aware that god gives me 80 percent of it and the other 20 percent isn't picked up until i share it so what i don't really know what i know until i share it with others so a big part of it is that i'll say something today and i'll make a note of it and I think, oh, I didn't know that. I said that, but I didn't know it. And then I'll take that seed away. And that seed's going to be like an oak to me. I'm going to unpack it. I'm going to expand it until it becomes a certainty. And then that certainty will be another seed that has the potential, like an oak tree, to produce another million seeds. An oak tree can produce a million seeds in its lifetime. So that, that oak tree, 500 years old, 200 feet high, 
comes from a seed that big and it produces another million seeds and each of those million seeds produce another million seeds it's the our, our potential to learn is or to reveal is infinite but the, in order to get it we have to constantly share it if we don't share it then we don't you know it's you know the sharing of it is when we place it in the soil and we let it fertilize so i'm um i'm just excited about understanding more and becoming um a better utensil, a cleaner utensil. I've still got some bits that I'm picking away at. I've still got the, me pinning the crab shell, pulling away at little bits and pieces. But I love people, and and I and I, I want to. I want. I, I've seen. I've seen everybody, everybody through one person. I remember talking to a kid who was sitting outside um, Piccadilly when I was going to a very important meeting, and she was sat there, blue with cold, maybe seventeen. Oh man, I can't even tell you. I, I, I go over to her and talk to her and I'm crouching down, but I just want to pick her up. Mm -hmm. It's my daughter I'm looking at. It's my son. And I, I, just, I want to give her something. I mm -hmm. say, let me give you my gloves. So I give her my gloves. She can't even put them on. She's so cold. She never stops smiling. I put the gloves on her fingers. <clears throat> and through her, I see my daughter. I see my three daughters. I see my son. I see everybody. And I'm suddenly thinking, I'm going to this stupid fucking job and my daughter is sitting in a doorway I, I was overwhelmed with compassion mm. so uh, what, what I'm what I'm hoping is that if something me and you say today takes somebody out of that discomfort even if it's just for an hour even if it just triggers curiosity even if you say to, even if they just get the fact that their depression their fear their violence their crime wherever they are it, is it is um is symptomatic of something bigger that beyond that little dot of depression is a vast network of potential for them there is nothing that they can't access there's nothing they can't achieve but if they're going to live a binary life um they're always going to be living within their conditioning they're always going to be trying to fix things at the level of the message board you know what i mean i'm i'm, I'm encouraging them to let go of that get their own will back and go quantum and then Everything is in a superposition. Everything is, the potential is there for everything. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it is a lifetime's work. But if we don't get up in the morning and at least try and live like a saint, we've got no business breathing in the free air. I think it's, an ex it's a really exciting time. The potentiality, because people are looking now. People are going, this, you know, there's um, this... You know, this COVID thing is making people look. It's making, you know, making people look at what else they can do, what else they want to do. Um, you know, COVID's interesting, but what about, you know, what about the parasites and, you know, what about the virus of um, conditioning? What about the virus of cigarettes? What about the virus of sexual pornography? What about the virus of violence? What about the vir virus of gossiping? How many people do we destroy when we sit around having a coffee? There are, there are loads and loads of viruses that people have already got and the big shiny keys is stopping them from looking at it. So I'm hoping it might encourage them to look at, well, what other viruses are there? You know, what, if, I, if I look at my life, I'll say to somebody now, if you really want to challenge yourself, don't gossip for a week. Don't be unkind about anyone for a week. See how hard it is. See how difficult it is not to slag somebody off. You know, or, or, if you, or even if you just add, add a word to it. So if you, if, you're, if you want to slag somebody off, just do this, just go... So and so is horrible, and just add, just add these three words at the end, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> and if you um, say that every time, if you say, if you say that every oh. time, you might not say it quite so much. I read a book called "Ego is the Enemy," and I know how tricky. Um, yeah, ego is. It's just, it's just. Well, it's the pseudo sovereign. It yeah, thinks it's king, yeah. but the pseudo, the, the ego. Is a is a good servant but a bad master. Even the yeah. mind, even the mind is a is a poor master. We've got to go to the level of the soul. And the when we talk about the level of the soul, we're talking about the level of the will, yeah. to be self willed. And once we have that will, once we're congruent and we can we can choose what we do, then we can surrender that will. We can um, abandon that will to a greater will. So we can go from being a tiny little computer to being a quantum computer. We can yeah. go from a binary system to a quantum system, which basically means we can access anything, anywhere. The universe will, a um, bit like light going through water. You know, if you look at a frog in, in the bottom of a pond, it's not where you think it is. 
because the light refracts through the water at the perfect angle for your eye to meet it. Mm. So, so nature calculates the billions of possible routes and gives your eye the perfect route. You don't have to do that. That would take you years to try and calculate that. So when you, when you clock into this quantum computer or this divine sat-nav, it will work out all the possible routes for you and show you the optimum route. Yeah, yeah. Have you sustained a lot of injuries over your life? Yeah, from the training, yeah. From the training it was, mostly. Yeah, my, most of my injuries come from training. I got uh, stabbed and battered a couple of times on the door, but my elbows yeah. are both really damaged from, the, from doing heavy, heavy end judo. Mm. Obviously, I've got my, my ears are both cauliflowered. Um, I broke my, both of my hands lots of times. I've had teeth in my hands. Mm. Um, and believe me, when you go in hospital and you've got teeth in your fingers and you've got educated people coming round um, who have got to take those teeth out for you because your hand's swelling up like a balloon, it really make, it's a really good place of introspection to have a really, is this how I want to live my life? Is this what I'm going to, am I going to take the textbooks out tomorrow and show my children how to do this? Am I going to show them how to use marijuana, my children? Am I going to show them how to use heroin? Am I going to show them how to access sexual pornography? Sexual pornography is one of the biggest vampires. It's a terrible vampire. Climbs in people so quickly. Am I, most of the things that we rationalize for ourselves, we would never teach our children. Yeah. We wouldn't sit them down and teach them. I had a girl I was teaching once who was... Um, it was a prostitute, um, and, uh, and she was rationalizing why she did it and how it was okay. I said, oh, that's really good. I said, when are you going to start teaching your daughter to be a prostitute? She went mad. And I said, oh, so it's, it's not good enough for your daughter then, but it's good enough for you. It's okay for you. And she was a damaged kid, a very beautiful mm -hmm. kid as well. Mm -hmm. But I said, listen, you know, if you're not prepared to teach it to your child, um, if it's not good enough for your child, then it's not good enough for you. Yeah, you know, yeah. you can do, but yeah, but how am I going to make the rent? I can't earn. I said, there are people earning thousands of pounds an hour. Mm -hmm. If you want to earn money, there's ways of making money. There's ways of making yourself valuable um, without, you know, um, without having to put yourself in those kind of d damaging, compromising positions. Because yeah. it's an abuse, you know, and it's an abuse even to, even to be a purveyor of it is an abuse, isn't it? Yeah. So many lessons then on today's podcast. Um, it's probably the most philosophical one that we've ever done and perhaps appropriate at a time when mental illness, depression, anxiety, domestic violence are at an all-time high and exacerbated by the lockdown. So many lessons here today and I'm sure this is just, you know, absolute... Um, self holistic self medication your words are holistic self medication yeah. for people watching this today as well as Jeff's 50 books <laughs> <laughs> you've got quite an extensive reading list homework if you are, are on this inner journey we've got Eckhart Tolle who does distill these concepts down to layman's terms it's a, perhaps a good one uh, rather than jumping on someone like Nietzsche right away, who is m more thick in the philosophical realm. His favourite book, though, is um, Eke Homo is the one I like the best out of yeah. him. But, but quotes books as well. There's one called um, The Great Thoughts by Arthur Sells. It's this thick. And you've, you've listed a lot of philosophers and authors today. But The Great Quotes... It ended up one of two Tony's favourite books. Two Tony's, if you're not familiar, he's the guy who protected me in prison, Bonanno, crime family associate. He was doing 141 years or whatever it was. Um, he, he would always, when he was in a mood, he would always grab the great uh, thoughts by Seld and just open a random page. And um, they're all in there, plus a, a million more. Um, so there's all this, this, this reading list information out there. I'll put these authors' names in the description box and of course Viktor Frankl we touched on a few times Man's Search for Meaning Man's yeah. Search for Meaning um, he saw in Auschwitz that the people who lasted the longest were the, the ones who put meaning into their lives and he got out and wrote these books and they have sold millions and influenced so many people all over the world so did yeah. you know? Did you know he created logotherapy? Yeah, yeah. And logo, the logos comes from it comes from the Hebrew Bible, and it logos means literally means the word of God. It, it, logos means purpose. 
So uh, logotherapy is man's search for purpose. If the, if you're depressed now or in the place of fear, there's a, there will be a hidden purpose to that. And he said that hidden purpose was literally the word of God. So in other words, it was, you know, it was it was it was the last say in everything. So if you want pure essence, Frankel at the end of his book, Man's Search for Meaning, it's not a big tome, but at the back of it he does a whole section on logotherapy, yeah. which is just about how people can heal themselves and cure themselves just by finding a purpose to their suffering. Powerful. Channeling that energy, recycling it, like Jeff described how he had the energy channeled into violence. And that was just consuming him and it was this fire that he couldn't put out. But then, you know, he learned to channel the energy into these positive things now to where he's absorbed all this knowledge and his, his goal is just to spread that knowledge. Like just that wave just going out there through these podcasts. He doesn't even read his comments, doesn't care about the feedback. He's not in here for that. He's in here to influence the lives of complete strangers and just spread that positivity around. So... Um, contrary to that, then in the material world, Jeff's links for his Instagram and his, his books will be in the description box, as will link to our socials and everything else um, down the, our playlists. Um, huge thank you to all the new subscribers. Subscription logo is in the bottom corner down, down there. And I know we're not hugging because of the COVID, but we, we're allowed to do the bumps. Oh. There we go. <laughs> all right, then. Take care out there. Let us know what you thought, and you know I've I've learned so much today. Thank you, Jeff. I read a lot um, back in prison. It was over ten years ago now, and it, a lot of it's faded out of my head. But you've really brought it all back, and then some. Uh, so I really appreciate. Well, thanks you. for inviting me. It's yeah, a real real yeah. honour to be on the podcast, and I, I love what you're doing. I'm really, I really admire that you you know that you've taken those experiences and that you're trying to help because that's what there's nothing better than that. I love it. That's why I've come down today. You know, it's. Um, you know, I just love what you're doing. So, uh, nice. so congratulations on an amazing following as well. You've got some great kids out there following you. Yeah, I mean that's our mission: just getting people on to share the stories. Yeah, and hoping it's going to resonate with the viewers, and also you know helping people who are just out of prison or have, have been abused um, get their lives back on track. People who are just coming out of that, not advanced um, on the journey like yourself. But yeah, yeah. and uh, we have seen. Uh, a lot of people reach out to those guests and help them, you know, uh, relocate and help them get on YouTube and all this stuff. So, like you said, the book is a gate. It's like a door into your world. Yeah. You deep out there and it led to Chuck Knowles coming through that door. Yeah, yeah. And it's the same. You with noticed. People. You put the book out there. You suddenly you noticed. Yeah. People see it and that that attracts teachers. You know, that attracts people that want to help you expand. They want to help you expand because they expand in helping you. You know, I, if I'm helping you or, or a listener expand, I can't help but expand myself because yeah. I'm just delivering the stuff. So I'm going, to be, I'm going to be processing it through every one of my trillions of cells. I'm going to be hearing this stuff for the first time. Even if I'm telling the same story, I hear something new that I've not heard before. So I expand with every, with every telling of the story. It helps me to expand and, and obviously... There's a responsibility with expansion to help people that are maybe one step behind you who, who have an inkling but haven't quite figured it out yet. So if you get a chance, you know, um, I've got hundreds of um, podcasts online, uh, talks that are all free. You know, um, they're all there. You can just go on and get them. They're all free, you know. Um, so and, and there are teachers out there who are who just want to give you the stuff they want to help you with it this out there but it's all ultimately it's about doing there's a beautiful saying from the quran um first we do then we hear so it it says um it says that what's the word god favors those who strive he doesn't favor those who don't strive in other words it's a universal law when you move the universe reciprocates it moves with you if you stay still you'll recede because everything else is moving forward. So we have to do and then we hear. So we, we do first. We have to take that step. We have to lean into the sharp edges, lean into the fear. Be curious. Just be curious about it. You know, there's that feeling again. I'm going to look at that. You know, have I got free will? Have I really got free will? Let's have a look at it. Let's just be curious. Let's have a look at that book. Especially if something you says, sometimes if you talk about God, it repels people. Great. Then I'm your teacher today. Why is it repelling you? 
have a look at that. Curiosity is a great thing and the learning out there, believe me, it's infinite. It's so exciting. Some of the stuff that's landed on my doorstep for me to grow. It's amazing. It's a very exciting time. Well, Jeff, you've motivated me to do more inner work. And I imagine some of you out there as well will be inspired by this. It's like you've held up a mirror today to me, to to my own flaws. And I realise by discussing these things with you that some of the dark energy I've um, experienced in the last year or so, um, how that has been attracted into my life and things I have to work on. So I really appreciate that. It's a pleasure. It's my pleasure. And uh, we're going to have to leave it here because it's, it's, uh, it's two o'clock almost. No yeah, way. Yeah, so you, thank you very really? much for coming on. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Where did that go? That's mad. Just that like was that. great. I loved it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Welcome.